I have a fun lecture for you because you know I'm not such a fan of those classic PowerPoint stuff. So what we're doing here is now I invite you to my editing studio. So this is basically our timeline there and our film. And um, this is you know consisting of a lot of different stuff we've been experiencing over the recent years and a lot of production inside and also of course we'll cover the the meta topics of what's going on in the automotive industry and since you're here in Germany today we also cover what's going on in the German automotive industry because everyone knows and everyone loves the German automotive industry but of course the German automotive industry also has their con side so um, which no one really knew before before 2015 maybe but um, you know uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, um, uh, you know, one good example to start with that is, um, you know, yes, we have really great cars, and I also really like German cars, and they are like very special in certain different features. I'll tell you more about that soon. Um, but on the other hand, of course, there's like a lot of political influence. For, I'm, I'm not sure if you followed the news in this respect because, um, like for this year, there were some massive diesel bans in the cities announced. And so what politics did is like they just, um, you know, changed the pollution levels on which is what is allowed and what not. Yeah, and that's the problem and it's gone. You know, that's, yeah. So that's, that's an easy solution. Just, ah, you know, it's not like uh, this level where something is, uh, is forbidden. You know, just lower the pollution level or something on paper and then the problem is solved. Yeah, but that's politics, you know. Do you, do you know a definition of politics? Is transition of problems to the next generation. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, but you know, we, we of course also still want to have fun with cars, and I also want to show you a little bit of the contrast between what we have at the moment and what we probably have in the future. And so we start with a, let's say, very classic approach. <laughs> had a British car right there but um, <laughs> stuff like this is what you um, would usually say like you know, this, this is what car enthusiasts go for but it can of course be different um, but let's just focus on this one for a second because this is very interesting of what has been changing in the automotive industry look at the left side car from 1997 and look at the crash test result in 2017 on the right side just very normal small cars nothing special fancy cars which everyone can buy and you see that on the left side, the car is, you know, is basically gone. And the right side, you see, okay, everyone still lives. And I think, you know, the car itself, on the one hand, it does, hasn't changed so much over the past, like, 100 years. And on the other hand, there have been so many small developments in every diff different sector. And I think safety is one development that most people often forget, you know, when we also today talk about infotainment system and connectivity and so on and I think safety is one of the things you know we really have to focus so that's a nice entry so and what about the meta trends actually so one is of course you already talked about electrification and I just took a Tesla Model S here as an example because I mean it came out in 2012 but the funny thing is that even with the second meta trend connectivity even now, in 2019, Tesla Model S is somewhat still ahead of the competition in some ways. It's also behind in, uh, the competition in other ways. Here, for example, you can also check the Autogrefu website. And this was re really funny because um, autonomous driving, the meta trend number three, this was also Tesla in 2012 or 2013, and it was the time where the autopilot was still, well, not controlled. So 
what I'm doing at the moment here, this is actually not allowed. And the feature was not allowed in Germany, but they still, you know, they just didn't care. So no one from the regulators really looked at the Teslas because, you know, there were like a couple of Teslas, um, you know, on the road. And then, of course, what we are also being focusing on is sustainability. This has to do with the automotive industry. What it has to do with the automotive industry, I'll talk about later. But of course, we shouldn't, um, you know, we shouldn't lose track of that because everything we do has somewhat impact um, uh, on, on the world. The question is, how can we reduce our impact? So, just some very basic figures about the German automotive industry. The turnover, 426 billion. And um, you might wonder, how much is that really? Because some people always say, you know, now also when we have this shift in the automotive industry, what if the automotive industry in Germany goes down? You might also heard that um, Herbert Dies, CEO of Volkswagen, he said there's like a 50-50 chance that the big automotive manufacturers will survive this big transition period. And, well, he might be right because it's really critical. We have seen other industry segments where big companies have been going down. Of course, this Nokia example is always being stated because it didn't move from, from the normal phones to the smartphones. But also industries who have totally vanished, you know, like... Uh, what about an industry who, uh, who fuels street lanterns from whale fat? You know, we, we don't want to go back there. You know, and no one is, you know, if it's really pity for those industries to fade away. The question is what happens to the automotive industry. And just to give you a um, perspective, the total adding value, so like the, the total economic impact of the automotive industry in Germany is about 5%. So you could argue, yeah, that's a lot for one single industry branch. But it also shows you, it's not like when the automotive industry in Germany goes down, that the whole country is suddenly bankrupt. You know, so there's a lot of different other industries. And the automotive industry itself, of course, uses, you know, those figures, uh, the economic figures, and also the, um, you know, the, all the jobs they have. And then they go to the politics and they say, oh, we have so many jobs, you have to listen to what we're saying. And usually the politicians are listening. Um, you know, recently there has been a slight shift here and there, but then I gave initially one example. Usually the politicians listens, listen to them because this, you know, this job argument, you, you guys also know from the US, as soon as a big company says, oh, we have so many jobs, all politicians say, yeah, let's do what you want. That's, of course, always um, dangerous uh, in a way because you have to think about, you know, what's best for the, for the whole population and not, you know, looking maybe at the single job because you know when i say you know i'm a video producer and i have i have some problems you know in my branch also a couple of years ago the prices for like um, you know service video productions went down and shall i say oh you know can you maybe subsidize me because the video prices have dropped you know no one would do that but of course they do that for the automotive industry yeah so it's surely pro and con you see the workforce with a, uh, almost a million uh, people working in the automotive industry, not directly all at the manufacturers. It's also big time about the suppliers. And the thing is there that the suppliers, of course, not only supply the German brands, but also worldwide. So um, <clears throat> what's pretty interesting is that in Germany, um, you know, we don't have so many single big cities. You know, Cologne is one, Berlin, of course, Hamburg, Munich. But what we have more is like a lot of cities which have like this, you um, know, medium size. We have a lot of cities we have like 500, 600,000 people. And then there are also some smaller towns where we, we have those, you know, those hidden champions we call. So they are like small towns somewhere in the countryside and they have maybe like one company which is an automotive supplier and they are world market leader in some very, very tiny pieces of the automotive. Uh, so for example, like gear sticks you know there's a company like they're producing gear sticks and manufacturers from the whole world they buy gear sticks at this very very small company but then they may be leading in this very field and we got a lot of those specialized companies and that's also why so many people work in the automotive industry not directly necessarily at the manufacturers and this two percent figures by the way this is um, the share of the the total workforce in germany so again for one industry branch that's a lot yes but I can also just stress again, if there would be major problem with the automotive industry or maybe would be also job loss in the automotive industry, it's of course bad for those people, but it's not the end of the whole economy. So again, political influences, 
you have to you know rate it i think you know in a you know in a more um senseless approach as a senseful approach of course and um well what about the car market here with about yeah just over three million registrations every year the used car market by the way is almost double the size each year so about six million because when we talk about cars the used car market is quite often forgotten everyone you know manufacturers want to focus on the new vehicles because they want to sell them obviously but when you think about that you know six million cars a year change uh, the owner from the used car market that's of course also something we have to take into account especially will um, come later to the fact because also on the used car market it has a lot of connection with the technology from the new cars because so far when you thought about the used car market well you get a car and that's it. It is built in a way and it will stay the way it is built over the whole lifetime. But now we're switching to cars which are maybe fitted with one hardware, but then the software is more important and the car changes over time, you know. Maybe you get like one big infotainment screen and you don't order everything you, you, you might be able to order. And then the next customer maybe who takes the car after like two or three or four years is not really now like you don't have, oh, I don't have this feature, I don't have this feature, I just get this feature afterwards. So you can still upgrade a car when it's used. And this is, of course, an advantage on the one hand. On the other hand, the manufacturers want to make a business out of that because then they say, oh, you know, maybe we don't earn money with the cars initially, but we also earn money later on with selling the services and with selling the software. So if you want something special from the car later on after you've bought it, even as a used vehicle, then come to us again, to the manufacturers, and give us even more money, maybe even for a monthly subscription fee or so. Uh, this will be also you know, a major topic if you think about you know, the, all the uh, economics of how actually you will be able to earn money with cars in the future. We've seen it also with other industries. Um, gaming industry is a very good uh, example, for example, I, I bought like games for like 100 euros or something and then that's it or software like I think my first editing software Final Cut Pro Studio was like I think two and a half thousand euros but then I owned the stuff and that's it and now you like have those annoying cloud programs where you have to pay like 20 euros or so a month and you know you can understand that but that's of course somehow annoying for the customer so Let's continue with the German automotive industry because Volkswagen is still the leading brand. This is a Golf GTE, by the way. Um, it won't play such a big role in the future. Soon come, come to that, uh, why is that? But uh, clearly Volkswagen is really leading it by far you know, in the German market. They have about 600,000 new registrations per year. The Golf is the strongest car for that. So um, of those 600,000, around 200,000 registrations is the Golf. So it's still the leading car. And you know, it's on the one hand somehow conservative, but if you take it for example here as a GTI, there are also a lot of car enthusiasts because it's a car where you can do a lot of things with, but you know, it still already delivers a lot of fun. This one here is now uh, the best seller number two, is the Volkswagen Tiguan. It's about 75,000 new registrations per month, uh, per year, of course, in, in Germany. And that shows also the other trend about the SUVs. Because already now, worldwide, about one third of all car sales are SUVs. And calculations that are in like two or three years, we're already at about two thirds. So we're moving more and more into the direction where people almost only buy SUVs anymore. And you also see that, that like for like 40 years, the compact segment where the Golf is, was the strongest segment in Germany. And now you can almost see that SUV is becoming one of the strongest one. Small car segment here with the Polo, this is uh, bestseller number three, about 70,000 registrations per year in Germany. Small car segment was always number two segment, most important, after the compact segment, but now also SUVs are slowly overtaking it. Then, well, <laughs> next bestselling car is the Passat, also Volkswagen, also about 70,000 registrations each year in Germany, mid-size segment here, this is a sedan here, but usually in Germany you buy the estate. It's the same also with the other mid-sized vehicles. Germans or general Europeans buy the estate, like here with the C-Class also. 
In the States, you rather see the sedans then, or then the SUVs. <coughs> C-Class available, of course, as convertible, coupe, sedan, and also here the SE Estate. Here about 60,000 registrations in the, um, in, in, in the most recent year. So um, Mercedes is also the second strongest brand. Overall 300,000 registrations each year. So that's half of Volkswagen. So you see like the big gap, you know, Volkswagen with 600,000, then Mercedes with 300,000. But also interesting that, I mean, Volkswagen is not a low price company, even if they're called Volkswagen, like people's car. And Mercedes, of course, then the fir first premium company in this list. So you see that Germans, yeah, they spent a lot of money for, for cars. You already see that in that list, that um, a premium manufacturer is actually the second most selling brand in the whole country. Of course, it always has to do with company um, leasing deals, for example, where they can offer very good rates. And another example is that BMW is the third most selling brand. They always switch around a little bit with BMW and uh, so BMW and Audi switch around their places. This one here, this i8 Roadster concept, where they already combine a little bit of new connectivity features. Soon, tell you, tell you more about that. Audi and BMW, about 250,000 registrations each year, so it's somewhat close to Mercedes. So um, two of those three premium manufacturers have the sales that Volkswagen has overall. You can remember that. So Mercedes 300,000, BMW 250, Audi also about 250,000. Then because they're so close, they switch around. Um, sometimes it maybe depends if a rental company makes made some big deals that can also change the registration figures um, massively. Audi A, uh, S6, by the way, I'll drive the new generation this week. This was still the previous generation. Well, and then finally some more or less budget manufacturer, which is at the next step in the registrations, and also about 250,000, so that's quite equal between BMW, Audi, and Ford from the registrations per year. And what is Ford in Germany? Well, they are also producing cars here, so it's funny that um, some conceive it a little bit German because so many cars are also built here. Of course, the you know the the, the parent brand is in the US. And the other way around is, is with Opel, you know, where they're owned from overseas, from the US, and now from the PSA Group in, in France. But Opel, of course, is, you know, has the, their home brand right here. So um, Opel has been, have been selling cars also a lot in the past. The registrations dropped over, over the past 10, 20 years. So um, after those lists here, so after it was Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, Audi, Ford, and then the next one would be Skoda. And the interesting thing is that all the manufacturers I mentioned initially, they all built cars in Germany. Not all of their cars. We'll also talk about soon, you know, where they built the cars and which models. But then the next company, which would be the number one importer, is Skoda, with about 200,000 sales each year in Germany. So and this has been, you know, a massive surge. So um, like 10, 20 years ago, Renault was very strong also, and Opel was way stronger, for example. Uh, Renault has, has been the, the strongest importer for a lot of years, but um, Skoda, you know, appeals to really a lot of people nowadays because, you know, they have the Volkswagen AG technology, but they sell it at a little bit more attractive price, and they're also between those segments. So their car is usually, um, you know, when, when, the, when the Golf is like this size, the Octavia is a little bit bigger, then there's the Passat, and then the Superb again is a little bit longer. So for the same price, you get a little bit more length in the vehicle. And that's why a lot of people um, have been going for those. So Skoda is almost, you know, taking up to Ford. And I guess that in the next years, they will probably even overtake Ford. And so the Volkswagen AG strategy is actually very interesting because on the one hand, people always wonder, Ah, you know, they have like VW, Audi, Seat, Skoda, you know, the, the most important sellers right here. Of course, they have those um, luxury brands there, but, you know, it doesn't really make sense to have the high-tech um, luxury brands. You know, they're just losing money. It's those luxury brands like Bentley, or if you also take Rolls-Royce, which belongs to BMW, those are rather some play balls for high-class managers. If they really would think about, you know, what makes sense on an economic level, they would just drop those because you cannot earn money with those cars. Even if they're very, very expensive, 
they're just not sold in in reasonable numbers where I could earn you know good money with and they also usually receive older technology so they cannot be updated like every five years or so the life cycle of a car has been you know shrunken to like five or six years was rather seven eight years in the past but those big luxury cars then they're usually worse than the cars that cost half the money so people always think about oh Bentley is cool Rolls-Royce is like the oh my life's goal is to own a Rolls-Royce but actually those are worse cars than the premium cars so the premium cars like in Audi BMW also we take the non-manufacturers like Lexus or so because they are on mass production they can actually build better cars than the luxury manufacturers who sometimes now take the chassis from the other cars but then make the car actually worse because they have less budget for the car they have less technology they have older technology so that's also very interesting insight I gained over the years because you know when you start doing this and you oh once in a lifetime I drive a McLaren or a Bentley and the Rolls Royce and then you drive those and think like why are people paying so much money for this and like why it's, it's mainly the brand so the cars themselves, they are worse than the cars you would buy for less money. But you know, there is a market where people only start buying cars at a certain amount. Maybe you've seen like this um, Bentley um, CEO interview. There was like a um, very short clip because I think it was like about the Bentayga and the price uh, threshold. And it was, I think, 250K or something. And then he said in an interview, oh, now we uh, solve the problem that the car was not expensive enough. So we solved the problem that you can spend more money because there's really um, a market where people start buying a car according to the price range. There's also one, um, one nice story about it. it was a small sports car manufacturer and they you know, hand built a great sports car and it was super fast and acceleration and so on. And then they sold it for like 200,000 euros and they wonder why no one bought it. And then they got an external consultant and they said, just, say, yeah, just double the price change nothing double the price and suddenly they were selling cars all over the world so because you know there's a, there's a certain group of people who have so much money they don't buy cars that are less uh, in price than a quarter of a million because it's you no know, then too much other people could afford it so but that's also interesting that's why you would also watch car reviews to really see not about the price and the marketing about the batch of the car but really what can the car actually deliver you know what what's the what's the real performance of the vehicle so and now well we talked about how many cars they are selling in Germany this is now Google Maps obviously all those red dots you see those are actually the production plants we have in Germany and you see that the distribution is actually quite equal um, it used to be rather just in in West Germany but then over the last decades, um, there were also some uh, subventions for the car manufacturers also to open something in East Germany and especially this, um, this Leipzig uh, area right here. It's also very well developing. You also see it in, uh, in housing and flat prices that the area is surging and Porsche have been investing there um, massively. And what we're actually going to do now, um, because you cannot see too much here from this whole overview map, so we're gonna split it basically in north to west to south and then also to east. So zoom in a little bit and then I can talk about what is actually there, what you can, what you can better see there. So this is now the northern part we've seen. Left upper part is, uh, uh, is the Emden plant of, of Volkswagen. They're building the Passat there and the Arteon. Passat and Arteon of course together because the Arteon is yeah, it's basically also a Passat technology-wise. It's just like a Passat Coupé, just with a different, um, different name now. In Bremen, that's very interesting, where you see the Mercedes star. This is where they classically built, for example, the GLC, or also the E-Class and the C-Class. And now I've been uh, driving it just uh, two days ago in Oslo, the new EQC, so their first electric SUV. And this is also majorly about the whole strategy of, of about what car manufacturers are doing because the question is are you using an existing platform or do you create a new platform for electric vehicles and it's really funny that both is happening at the same time and no one really knows what's the best solution so Mercedes actually decided to go for the existing platform so far so they 
basically took a GLC or it's like a GLC coupe and then they put the battery in the lower ground and made it an EQC. You know, it's a little bit longer, a little bit longer overhanging for the car. Well, what is the, the, the pro for that? You can save a lot of money. You have already an, an existing platform. The con is, of course, you have something like in the rear, you have a middle tunnel still. You know, there's no mechanical link between front and rear axle for the EQC, but you have a big middle tunnel, so you're losing space on the interior in the rear somewhat. And you cannot really get all the advantages of an electric vehicle. Also, when you think about the front hood, so there's no need for an electric vehicle to have a massive long front hood. Again, this is losing interior space. So you can only use all the advantages of an electric vehicle when you use an own platform. But then again, you have to think about how can you really make it profitable? Because after all, electric cars also have to be profitable for the big brands. And then the question is, which approach are they taking? If we now look at VW, those are no, their, their main, pl main plans. Um, the Wolfsburg plan, that is the one on the right side. So it's basically very much you know, centralized, so to say, in Germany, a little bit up in the north. This is where they traditionally build the Golf. So um, Porsche main plant, of course, um, people like to visit that. And in Stuttgart, they also have um, like the, the, the horse you see in the Porsche logo. That's actually the, um, uh, the symbol of, of the city itself. That's, that's why they have it right there. So and then we move on further a little bit more a little bit more south, so that would be like the third region. And this is um, BMW in Munich on the south part. But then, um, you know, this is where they mainly buy, uh, build the 3 Series, because that's again also in the main plan. They usually house the cars which have the highest volume. But then they also have a Dingo thing, that's um, the one here on, on, on the right, rather, where they build the bigger cars, 5, 6, 7, 8 Series, because they nowadays they try to limit the platforms. They have one like this bigger platform where they put a lot of cars in and then they have the new smaller platform where they make the front rear drive cars. So front plus rear, and the other one when they have all wheel drive rather rear plus front on demand. It's very interesting because now the new BMW 1 series which has been rear wheel drive all the, all the way, they now switch it actually from the rear wheel drive platform to the front wheel drive platform. It's actually good in a way because it gives you more interior space again. Because with those rear wheel driven cars, you usually put the engine in longitudinal, the long hood. And when you have the front wheel drive platform, you put the engine in a transverse way. Then you don't have such a long hood, but you have more interior space at the same length of the vehicle. Of course, there are some BMW enthusiasts who say, ah, you know, I need the rear wheel drive car. Um, but I've already driven like the X2 recently. Um, and you see that when you have the all-wheel drive in those cars, you still have somewhat a very good agile driving feeling. So it's actually not such a big of a problem. And um, they still will offer rear-wheel drive cars in the 2 Series, Coupe and Convertible, for the real hardcore BMW fans. So they actually try to serve both. Audi will also see um, a plant inside from, from them too. Of course, the main plant in Ingolstadt. Um, but then they also have in uh, close by there in Neckarsolm where they built the A8. We'll have an inside there, live on video there too. Um, but you see that the south, the very south is of course really BMW and, and Audi land. Um, <clears throat> the upper BMW part here is Regensburg. That's where they built the 1 series and the 2 series I've just been um, talking about. And finally, we have this East region, um, I mentioned that earlier, where again BMW has have been investing in Leipzig especially. It's actually their most modern plant then, so to say, and they built the Macan there. And this is very interesting with the Porsche SUVs because, you know, most of you maybe also when you're a car enthusiast, you say, oh, like Porsche is like the sports car brand. But more and more worldwide, people who also don't know the heritage, and especially in China, people say like, yeah, that's an SUV brand, isn't it? So because meanwhile, Porsche sells more SUVs than sports cars. And that's of course a shock for every true Porsche sports car fan. But that's just, that's just fact because most of the sports cars are just not comfortable enough for the, uh, for, you know, for, for, the, for the mass market. And that's also why the Cayenne has been such a big success and now also the Macan. Actually their mid-size SUV, the Macan, is now is the most important model now, you know, because 
People want to get the Porsche feeling, they want something sporty handling, they want the look, they want the brand, but they still you know, want an easy get in and out of the car and not like crouching in the sports car in and out. And that's what they basically then also get with the Macan. And it's even more shocking maybe for Porsche and Fulvia that their most important version is the Macan as the two liter four cylinder. And that's of course, oh my God, oh my God, how could that be? But that's just the case because uh, world when you see not so many people care about is it the V6 or V8 that's again the car enthusiast issue so a lot of people also say ah oh, you know whatever I don't care just give me the badge and give me good driving and even as a two liter four cylinder it has enough power and then you know the question is if you really care about the number of cylinders I of, of course I feel a difference it is more fun to drive a V8 yes but you can also understand that you know when you have con congested roads and low, uh, um, uh, low limits uh, for, for the speed you can actually drive, it doesn't matter so much. Not every country is Germany where you can hammer it out on the, on the, on the motorway. So and now um, we talked about those plans. Let me just get you in a, a deep insight because this one here. Talk about the Audi earlier, or oh, there was one Skoda car driving, that was coincident. Usually you just see Audis around there. This one here is the A8 production, it was actually still the previous, um, previous model. But um, the thing is that when they release a new generation, they always say like everything is all new. But that's not always the case. So of course uh, some core um, tools remain somewhat the same. And the interesting thing is that you see really a transition uh, also inside those assembly plans because on the one hand it is somewhat very classic, it is like, like a steel industry. And on the other hand you have some parts where you say like oh this is really already high tech. And you really can feel that it's somewhat moving you know, between worlds. This is for example you know, where the you know, so-called wedding or marriage is taking, and taking place. So everything is going from underneath to the top of the chassis then from the A8. And um, those, those yellow ground robots, you say, they are moving basically freely, but they have those uh, you know, um, induction fields on the ground where they follow the path, actually. And you still need a lot of human work in, in there. It has been reduced over the years, yes. But if you especially look at those um, screw works from underneath the car, obviously, it's still better to use people right there because it would be too complicated really to find the very small spots where to put the screws right there. So when you visit a manufacturing plant and you see people working on the car, this is what they usually do. Or for example here, <laughs> I was also allowed to grab this front grill. Um, it's actually quite heavy. So it looks light, but it's actually quite heavy. And the thing is, you shouldn't damage it, any, uh, of course, while, while, uh, while doing anything. It can be very expensive. But I think it's really interesting where to really find still human work and where to find robot work. Um, if you think about you know, paint shops, for example, you know, a couple of decades ago, the paint shop was done by hand. And this was, of course, a massive change because, especially in, in painting a car, there's a massive time difference if you do it by hand or if you let it do it by the machines. And um, later on in, in the video lecture, we'll also see um, new technologies where they try to replace humans even more, or where you have this uh, human robot corporation. It's also fixed terms, um, HRC. You always, you know, sometimes say about industry uh, 4.0. That's also another important term for that. Um, yeah, the question is really, you know, where, where is that going? We recently also heard from Tesla, they have been trying to. Um, you know, make everything automated, but then they found out, hmm, maybe we have too much uh, of that and it's not really working as the way we thought. So at the moment we seem to be at a stage where you still need both, where it's not possible to produce it all the way automatized. If we uh, watch this video lecture maybe in 10 years, we say like, um, you know, what has been, what's been going on there? And maybe just the cars, they go off just fully automatized. This is, by the way, now already the, the, uh, the final check. You can see there are also some different market specifications. You see the turning indicators sometimes. And then they check if there are maybe some scratches during the production or so, but usually there's not so much they do afterwards. It's just a basic check. This was then the Hanover plant. So 
like the middle, middle northern part of Germany and there you can see everything is way wider from the whole dimensions. It's even more classic in the whole building style. And you also see throughout the process that the chassis are being transported, yes, because they are so heavy, but then you see even more human work in, in this respect. And um, it might be one of the reasons why those are also still quite expensive. You know, you might think commercial vehicles not so expensive, but the T6 especially, they're really expensive vehicles. And if you spec them properly, like a passenger car variant, you can get one of those to about 80 or 100k. That's really astonishing. So, and there you can see, again, most of the uh, things you can see where people are working are again, you know, like something screwing from underneath. You see they have those uh, moving chairs then in this case. It depends on the car and the manufacturer if they are sometimes sitting or if they are um, uh, walking. Sometimes they also tr now try to combine some aids for the workers. For example, when they have a heavy part that they don't have to carry it themselves. But then they have a robot arm, but a robot arm that is not moving itself. But the worker is actually moving the robot arm, it's just assisting with the weight. So this is also again the transition from you know the total manufacturer manufacturing work by hand up to a fully auto uh, automatized one. And yeah, and that's always a lot, of, a lot of fascination when you um, just see all those unfinished cars and then how they um, piece by piece become one. So um, I think you this week you're also going to see like I think you're going to Ford, right? Yeah, yeah, that will be very interesting. I can tell you. Uh, don't be surprised also that Ford is rather a very classic plan. You know, it's maybe it was there already um, before the war, so it's rather old plant. So um, probably even a little bit less modern than this one. But I think you can get a very good insight then how you have this, this combination of very old manufacturing and then also of some new newer trends. So we can also scroll further a little bit here because that one is again then the absolute contrast. They have been introducing this one here, this is the stamp workshop, just like four years ago. This one is one of the most modern worldwide. You see it's also now shut off for the noise um, um, em emissions. And you see they also need those very big tools because it's actually also a bigger car. This one is also fully automatized. So this is maybe a whole area where you know, 100, 200 people used to work and check things. And now there's like one or two guys, you know, in a, you know, just doing like some oversight if everything is working. This one again is again the exact contrast. So what is Bentley doing? This is done in, in crew in England. They are actually getting the chassis from the Q7 from Audi. It's being transported over there, there and then they do their handcraft work with that. For example, you know, like with with the steering wheels and the stitching um, and the seats. They apply a worse infotainment system than it is been before, <laughs> stuff like this. So uh, also with the woodwork, very interesting. You might always want to, it lo always looks that thick, you know, when you have some wood in the car, but it's just this, you know, the one you see on the outside is a very, very thin layer. And there's also a reason why they do that because they need those thin layers that they can also create some symmetry. You know, they, they cut it in a way that for example, in, in a Bentley car, on the left side, you have basically a symmetry image on the right side because it was taken from the same piece of wood. That's very interesting. Now, of course, they use the animal skin right there. We we'll also get into this topic um, a little bit later on. There you can also see how they do the stitching on that. Leather, of course, a big issue in the automotive industry if you think about sustainability because uh, it really harms animals, people and the environment. But we'll later talk about that. So this is very interesting because the seats are taken out basically. There's also a lot of stuff you can see at third uh, party uh, industry, uh, industry companies, for example, at, at Bravos in, in Bottrop, close where I live. So they do a lot of work, which you know, some tuning companies would actually do when they take single parts out and you know, make some special work on that. And that also explains the, the higher price they have, but of course, it's not that the Bentley would cost double the price in, pr in production than an Audi Q7. So the rest of the price is just the batch you again then have. And then you can also, this also a story about this car is that um, there was, was, was a wife of a buyer and she wanted to have a color of her handbag made on the car. 
So, and then they made this car uh, with this blue exterior and also then with the um, blue on the interior. It's a very nice story if you have too much money. Um, <laughs> so if you ever fancy, you know, a car in your handbag color, um, yeah, Bentley does that. Other than that, you know, they try to fulfill a lot of customer wishes, but they are overall in their whole thinking very, very conservative. And I'm not really sure if they are really um, fit for future customer demands. So um, that's again the thing with those old school luxury manufacturers. I'm not really sure if we will see those like in 10 or 20 years. Of course, they still try to do something new. This one, for example, is the Goodwood plan of Rolls Royce because we've also been talking about them. And what's interesting here that this is a 3D simulation of the whole plant. And why would they do that? Um, of course, not just for show purposes, because they want to optimize their production. And if they have basically an image of the whole plant, they can see where do we put which parts or where do people work? Where are those supply chains inside the assembly plant go? So they can really optimize the timing, for example, that production needs less time, that they actually also need less space in that, inside the plant so they can optimize the processes then. And there are a lot of new technologies evolving there of how to put piece A to B. Of course, there's, you know, it's nothing new with the just-in-time delivery, but the question is also how to deliver the parts then. Um, at, towards the end of the lecture, there's also a, a, a drone transport I can show you. So there's an Audi test track here and also some newer assembly insights. This is, for example, again, now more and more examples of what can robots actually do. This is again a new STEM workshop. So you can see this is also looking quite um, equal to the one we've seen at Volkswagen commercial vehicles. It's of course where they also share technology, development and also the people that, that build those stuff for them. That's what I told you initially, there are just two guys watching all over that and this is of course in, uh, reducing jobs is of course also a very big problem. That's also one of the reasons why uh, Bill Gates suggested to have a robot tax worldwide because when jobs and jobs are more and more reduced by automation, you know, where shall the money go and just to the companies and what do people actually work and how do they pay for their living. So this robot tax idea I think is very interesting because it actually could, you know, for example, and get to the, like a basic basic income or so that people are actually not facing the disadvantages of the automation. Actually everyone, like the whole society, should profit from the automation and not maybe just, you know, like, um, you know, like the, the, the top managers of a company or so. This is also very impressive now. Um, those are one of the standard robots you see in the automotive industry because they have um, so many joints, they can actually turn parts very well. And this is also something which have, has been done by humans in the past. So you can see the newer the plants are, the more and more is automatized. Of course, to, uh, to save cost again. Um, but then again, it's the question with the new electric vehicles, you need less parts. You also need less uh, human workers overall. So it could also be a chance for high uh, wage countries, again, with the electric vehicles, that you get the manufacturers back to your home country because you don't need to spend so much money on wages anymore due to the electric vehicles. What we've seen in the past decades is that especially the German manufacturers, they have been moving for example plants to, to Eastern Europe, um, Audi recently also like the Q5 manufacturing to Mexico because the wage cost is about like just one quarter or one fifth. Then of course they can even earn more money. But then in the future I think I see a trend that the manufacturers can use their high wage countries themselves again because not so many people will work in the plant. It will rather be about the technology. This is also one of my favorite parts here, the paint shop, which is done um, all um, autonomous. You can also save a lot of paint with that. This is also you know, an interesting fact. And you might wonder with those, um, with those colors because they paint so many different colors and they can indeed just paint the blue car and directly after that they can paint a red car because you know they have the cleaning mechanisms uh, in those nozzles and this is actually not a problem so also very interesting but then when it gets to the detailed work unique workforce once again the question um, I always get is um, we like when a German car is built abroad like in, in Mexico or also in North America are they somehow different than the cars that are built in Germany 
And you know, I have also been driving those. And the thing is, usually they have the same quality marks and the same, you know, um, they usually send German trainers over there also to train the workforce and they have um, same, you know, regulations and quality standards. So you can say it is somewhat equal. It rather depends on now how they want to produce the car. For example, um, you know, if you think about the um, VW Beetle, which, is, um, also, which was also a new generation built in Mexico, they wanted to produce it in a more budget way and you felt that actually the difference when you drove the car here in comparison to the Volkswagen that has been built here. But it's not because you know, workers over there or the technology over there would be worse or would be less schooled. It's more about the approach which they want to do. And it's quite often that for the Northern American or the Southern American market, they are rather producing it on a more budget level to keep the price a little bit lower. And because they say, oh, you know, they don't pay attention to, to the quality that much, then maybe in Europe, that's more what, what, what's behind it. But I think also the customers are expecting more and more those days. So now when we come to a little bit more future of manufacturing, this looks a little bit like slow auto scooter. <laughs> But actually, again, those with, you know, when you have certain induction um, fields in the ground, which tell the car actually where to go. And this can be another example of optimizing the whole assembly floor that you don't need, for example, like a, like a, like a fixed chain or something at a certain place that you can a little bit more operate on demand and more freely, or that you can maybe control it by just by computer where those chases are going to. This looks, of course, a little bit random, but this is just an example. They also put it in a way with those columns to show that it's actually pretty precise to let those um, uh, chassis cycle around. Same accounts also for those toolboxes. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. You know? Always centralized back again. I guess they like, like the people going right there like, who must in love? <laughs> toolbox out of place, toolbox in place, toolbox out of place, toolbox in place. You can play that all day. But it's uh, really interesting that, for example, when you think about you working on a car and then you think, oh, I need like another tool and then just the tool comes in a separate wagon just behind you. This can be very, very effective. Here in this case, they're doing it via laser scanning to really get the exact position of where the toolbox is going from. And I think also one of the biggest advantages for that is you can change your production over the years and also a little bit. Because if you change to a new model, for example, you might want to adapt. You might want to adapt the tools. And then if you don't have like such fixed uh, workflows and you can operate a little bit more freely, then of course it's easier to change. And you know, in the past decades, it has rather been the case that you use you know, one, um, you know, one assembly line for a lot of years and you kept the basic things. But nowadays, products are changing um, so fast that you might be able to adapt a little bit faster to that. So let's go a little bit forward right here. This looks a little bit like, um, like Star Wars, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can, yeah, this is uh, also like some, or maybe like, a, like an automatic lawnmower or something. You say automated guided vehicle. So this is also, again, uh, something they use to um, just to, to browse things around in the factory because that's you know still made a lot of parts. Or oh, this is another example you know of this human robot corporation where you can actually have both. So human controls it, but of course he couldn't really push it all by his own power. And this could be the number one job loss because you remember that we've seen a lot of people doing this. In this case here, this just you know this first a prototype, but. Um, this could be you now. This could be really fierce for the workers right there. And then again, the question is, you know, what you do with those job losses? Also, a big, big topic. And even getting getting here into those like very fine works. I mentioned that earlier, like the very big parts already automatized. But then when it's about you know doing like some fine finger work, and you see that even are inventing those robots now, which can actually do very fine finger work, which usually could just be done by humans. Again, it's somewhat cool to automatize that and it's a lot of fascination by that. And you could think about that uh, you don't need to work so many hours per week then. But, you know, we've seen that um, the profits went up 
and also um, you know the, the efficiency in production went up but somehow you know the hours of work you have to do per week also went up and it didn't went down so and that's again you know this um, contradiction we have there in our world of work this is again also something which usually would be driven but can also be automatized um, so you see most of those ideas they have there in production is really about moving part a, a, uh, like from, from A to B. And that might be also some good question you can ask at, at Ford what they, are, you know, what they are planning in this respect. So how they see it uh, between you know, this automated stuff and also the human workforce, how they see the future there. That might be a good question for you. Not sure if this one is really realistic. Um, but that's also a thought of moving parts from A to B then with, <laughs> like with this flying steering wheel then. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really funny and interesting to see, but I'm not really sure how realistic that is. Um, that again is more realistic. I'll soon also show you why. Um, that they work inside not only the, the, the assembly plant, but also in development with augmented reality. <coughs> we also see that nowadays um, even being introduced in cars itself. Um, this is a major thing for training, for example. If you think about, you know, like um, opening a manufacturing plant somewhere over the world, and they don't even have to be on location, a trainer could be at the main headquarter and then tell you something what you need to do, and you have like this augmented reality headset, and then you see, oh, I need to put a part there, and the piece there, or maybe also like this in the 3D surrounding. So for training, this is uh, really important, and of course, also for prototype testing. So it is being said that the amount of time manufacturers can reduce their, um, their prototype stage is about one third. So you can reduce the time by about one third because they can just do things virtually and not like build something then say, oh, let's fail, let's build again, let's build another prototype. This was also mainly a thing here for the Seat Ateca, it's a Volkswagen Tiguan sibling, and I could test it out at Seat myself. Uh, because they use it uh, also quite a lot to reduce the time they, they need for their prototypes. And for example, they, they find also certain spots where they can put parts in or then they have the seat set up here and want to test, for example, when you are inside the car, how can you reach over to, let's say, <laughs> the glove box or the cup holder or something. It's pretty weird when you have the thing on, by the way. So on the monitor, you see what I see, like on the left and the right eye on the, uh, on the left side. So that's what I see at the moment through those glasses, of course, in the 3D surrounding then. And then I can also see now how it reacts, uh, like how, do I, how far do I have to reach to the door? Is something, you know, um, you know oriented in, the, in an ergonomic way? And this is then getting very weird when you have those controllers and you have the interface between the controllers and then touch something like a can here with the controllers. This is, you know, something, you know, they, they test like when we put a can in somewhere, where can we put it then, you know? Uh, it, it might uh, seem like a, like a minor thing, but if you can reduce weeks of work with that, it's also like a money issue. And this is also one good example. So um, they, they, they were searching also for a place for their central um, uh, CPU, uh, CPU un unit there. And then they actually discovered, uh, um, they actually um, discovered here um, in this 3D model, so this is again a whole 3D model of the car, where you could also go to the inside of the car. And then they saw, oh, you know, without wasting any space on the interior, let's find like a fitting space for like this module, which is like this long and this thick. And then they could check inside the 3D model, oh, that's, that's a good spot where we can put this, pe this part here without wasting any space and you know, it's not disturbing anyone if you put this part there. This is then again uh, saving some development cost. And um, some of you also have like economics background, so you know something about uh, marginal costs. Of course, at the moment it makes a lot of difference if you build like one car, 10 cars or 1,000 cars or 100,000 cars. You've seen it with the music industry, for example, nowadays, you know, it doesn't make any difference if you sell you know, one song or to one million guys. You know, it's even better, of course. But when you had to print like CDs or even more like that, like the vinyls and stuff, you had a lot of marginal costs. But the question is, where is it going with the cars? And one thing that could majorly reduce that, you see all on, the t on those tables there, 
Those are 3D printed parts and this could reduce marginal cost immensely. So there are even predictions that even the car industry could become an industry which is going towards zero marginal cost. I think it will never be zero but towards it so that it doesn't make such a difference if you produce 1000 or 2000 cars in, in the cost. And Ford is actually quite interesting what they do that they, they invest a lot in uh, 3D printing so that would be another good question for you for tomorrow. Ask them if they also have some 3D printing on location there. They have it a lot in the US already. I'm not sure if they have it here in Germany. So it's really funny that uh, Porsche is the only manufacturer who really uh, is able to do that and the reason is that they get a lot of platform and part share by the Volkswagen Group. So it's not so much more expensive to produce a Porsche than a Volkswagen or an Audi. But they just sell it for double the price. So <laughs> that's why, so Porsche is probably also one of uh, like the brands you pay most for the batch. You can see like uh, you know, when you buy a Porsche like for like 100K, you know that you just pay like 15,000 or so just for their profit. So that's like, if you think about that, you know, for me it's like, wow. So, but also interesting that you buy like a regular car, you know that you're not paying so much for the profit, but then you really pay you know, for all the work that has been done there, for the research, development. You also think about those, those crash tests I've shown you initially, that has also been done, you know, the, those cars are all gone after that. And um, by the way, also very in interesting news for the crash test. Um, you might think that they create a car to be the safest car on the road or the safest way like a front bumper is being designed but the thing is with those um, you know testing um, testing cycles it's the same like with the emissions so also for crash testing they don't create a bumper that is the safest but it's just the safest for this specific test so they could also create a bumper that keeps you safer in your everyday driving life but they you know wouldn't gain anything from that so they have like two or three different, this like the side pole test and then like a front row crash. And they design it exactly that it's the best performance for this very test result. Because that's what's counting in regulations and also in the crash test results. That's somewhat a pity of course, yes. And you might think about that's not really good for the customer and not really logical. But then again, what would be the alternative? The problem is you need, you know, certain test you know uh, levels to make it comparable also and how how do you want to measure it at some point you have to say okay we make a side pole test at 30 kilometers an hour and then you can also compare those test results so you can also you know understand why they do it in that way but then again it's somehow the pity that it always depends on how the test results are being done as for the emissions also um, that's, that was also the core problem of the Volkswagen diesel scandal because they were designing the cars how they were acting in the emission test and not on real road. That was the core problem of that. And also this, the problem when you see those official consumption figures where they never match the reality figures because they are also designed to uh, just perform in the test. This is being changed now by this new WLTP cycle. This one is now way closer in Europe than it was before with the old cycle. And yeah, about the platform use, um, <coughs> I think it is definitely growing that they use the same platform um, and the same parts, again, because of the profit margin, also because uh, they want to the share the latest technology. So if you think about the past and the difference between big and small cars, the big cars got all the latest assistance system, the new you know, connectivity, infotainment and so on. And nowadays, sometimes new stuff is being introduced with their smallest cars. For example, like Mercedes A-Class, it's the first cars who had this new MBUX infotainment system. The newest, the biggest one, also with you know, um, best, best voice input. Like in the past, everything was, was crucial technology-wise, was the S-Class. That's it. And then maybe some you know, smaller cars also get it over time. But you can't do that nowadays. So we uh, see it in the software industry, in the app industry especially, that more and more stuff is being put on the market without being like 100% finished. And we also see it in the own mode of industry, not safety related stuff, but especially something infotainment wise. So just put it on the market 
because you can learn easier and faster than what's wrong and, and what's right. And when we especially move now to the electric vehicles, um, the biggest platform change that we will have is the so-called MEB, that's the electric platform used by Volkswagen. So far the platforms are called MQB and MLB, it's for the smaller, for the transverse engine platform, and for the longer, it's, uh, MLB is for the longitudinal engine platform. They had this basic split in the past. By the way, MQB is also one of the um, most favorite words by you know, people who don't, uh, don't speak German. It's modularer Querbaukasten. So it's modular, uh, well, quer is like transverse, so it's modular, transverse, building platform. That would be the direction. So it's actually quite easy. But modular Querbaukasten, of course, sounds pretty freaky, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and that's why I also put like an MEB, is like the modular electric building platform. And this brings me back to this, um, this strategy perspective again. So, Volkswagen so far have built like their, their e-Golf um, on the normal Golf platform, also like the, um, like the, the e-Up on the normal Up platform. And they're now switching to an own electric building platform. We'll also see that um, later on in the pictures. And they want to actually put on the first MEB platform 10 million cars on just this one platform throughout their whole brands. And then, of course, it makes sense to do an own platform. Um, we've seen BMW using own special platforms, for example, for BMW i3. Then they realized everything you know, was too expensive. Also, the carbon fiber they have been using is too expensive. It's cool to save weight. But then, for example, if you compare an i3 to an e-Golf, what they did with the e-Golf, like the car is like 400 kilograms heavier, but they just put a slightly bigger battery in there and suddenly they have the same range. So, especially with electric vehicles, it doesn't make sense to go so much on weight savings. It's too cost intensive. You can regenerate the, brake, the braking and you know, the energy anyway. So it's not too bad with electric vehicles if they're heavy. So BMW goes from the own platform back to the integrated platform where they have like a three series and then they make an electric three series on the very same platform. Well, you know, now you really think, you now what is the right strategy? What is clear that all have this platform concept, more and more vehicles on the very same platform. But then the question is, do you really need specifically a separate platform for electric vehicles? Some say yes, some say no. So what I at the moment conclude from it is that you say yes when you have a massive amount of vehicles and no when you don't have a massive amount of vehicles. I think that's probably the solution um, midterm. We see how it plays out. Um, but this new MEB platform by Volkswagen, again, we'll see it quite soon. Uh, this could be the major game changer. Um, because they say that they then can produce electric cars on the price level of a current diesel. So at the moment, the diesel cars are like 1,500 euros more expensive than the petrol variants. When that's then the price for the full electric variant with like 300 miles or like 450 kilometers of, of range, that's of course really huge then. So um, this could actually also, you know, put like manufacturers like Tesla you know, in, in, in a very strong drawback. With Tesla, it's, it's really the thing. Uh, I think they either go like totally bankrupt or they go ahead of all others. I think there's no in between at the moment. Um, so it's like sometimes you think from day to day, like, you know, it's totally crashing or then again, oh wow, they have done like this very new, cool, fancy stuff. Um, I, I really can't predict what's, what's happening with Tesla. It's, um, almost unpredictable. That's probably also why the stock uh, market goes up and down as for that. So yeah, I think we have um, then some more time to get into the first meter topic we've been just talking about is electrification. And that's exactly the example for that. Because this is just the e-Golf where you can see at the launch, this is a normal Golf and they just put the electric parts in it without having any big advantage from that platform. And this is then the very, very classic approach to do the electric vehicles, where the manufacturers just started like, you know, let's gather some experience. How can we do that? And see how, you know, how the customer goes for it. Of course, the sales figures are not that high. Well, in Norway, they are actually. The e-Golf has been sold pretty much in, in, in Norway. Um, so I, I just returned from Oslo and it's really amazing. You come there and like uh, a whole level of the, uh, of the parking at the airport, a whole level 
like with, I think, 400 charging stations or something, is just reserved for electric vehicles. It's really amazing because they have heavy uh, government um, subsidies for the electric vehicles. Tesla is the most sold vehicle. The Model S has been like most sold vehicle for a couple of, um, of years now in, in Norway. Um, that's, really, that's really strange. Um, but you see here also just from the interior, this is nothing special. So this is also a question of how do I build an electric vehicle? Do I tell a customer, hello, I'm electric? Or do I rather say like, this is a normal car, don't be afraid. This is totally how it used to be. It's just electric, you know? And there are both approaches there. Um, if you look at sales figures, it seems to be that people are rather conservative and rather want this normal approach. Battery electric is one thing. This one here is a prototype of the A7Htron. That would be the fuel cell thing. Fuel cell is somewhat cool because you can fuel it up like a normal car and goes quite fast. You don't have like those long charging times. Um, on the other hand, it's not that efficient because you need to produce, uh, um, um, the, you know, the, the H2 for that. And it is somewhat good when you have some, you know, abundance of energy. Let's say like you have some windmills turning and you can store the energy, then you produce some hydrogen, then you can use it on the car afterwards. But most of the time we don't have the problem that we have too much power. Well, in Germany maybe, but not everywhere else. Um, so it's a question, you know. Um, just one excursion here to the German power grid. Uh, so, you know, we have those, you know, um, transition period at, at the moment. You have maybe heard of the Germans, uh, fame in Germans, Energiewende, where we put everything to renewable energies bit by bit. So we are far, by far not there yet. But at the moment we have the problem that in the north, where we have a lot of windmills, some days we have not enough power and we need to fire up the coal uh, plants again. And in some days we have too much power, like 140, 150 percent, and the power needs to be off the grid. And so we pay the neighboring countries to take our energy for free at those days, which is like, yeah. And that would be an example where it would be useful to have like those storage plants, for example, from used car batteries, it could be a future that you have those buffers with connected batteries. Or for example, that you produce hydrogen for fuel cell cars. That could be, again, fuel cell makes sense if you have certain spots where you have energy for free and need another way to store it. Then it makes sense. In other ways, it's, you know, the whole conversion process from A to B to C and then finally in the vehicle is not as efficient as you would have with battery electric. So battery electric is the most efficient way overall at the moment. But I think the crucial thing will, will be, this is the MEB now, the new platform, crucial thing will be new battery technologies which use less resources and are even more efficient, maybe even um, faster to charge. So the first thing about the MEB platform is you can see here a low floor, there's no big middle tunnel, you can use the interior space at the middle seat too. There it is, this is my colleague Brian. Um, you see there's a lot of wheelbase left actually and the wheels are really on the outside of the vehicle so that leaves again a lot of space on the interior and Volkswagen say that they can actually build a size of a golf car on the exterior with the space of a Passat mid-size vehicle on the interior. That's the key of this platform. And it's also funny, it's rear-wheel driven because they think that's awesome. Yeah, it is actually a more efficient way um, if you think about it. Uh, if you have a combustion engine, front-wheel drive is more efficient. Rear-wheel drive with electric is rear-wheel drive actually more efficient. efficient. This was one of the examples of what can happen then with this platform. This is an ID buggy, was present in Geneva. Because you might think about, yeah, electric vehicles might be less boring, less variation. But it can also be the opposite. Because they say when we have this big platform, we can not only build it 10 million times for ourselves, for our standard cars, they can also sell the platform for third party manufacturers. For example, um, you know, this could be built you know, by third party manufacturers. It would not make sense too much for Volkswagen to build this car on their own, for example, you know, because they can't, can't make too much profit from that. Maybe you know, for fun reasons or for image reasons. But if like a small third party manufacturer say, okay, we have like a workshop and we have some customers who would buy this fun car, but it's so, you know, 
so complicated to do the base work on our own. So they get the MEB platform from Volkswagen, maybe even together with the drivetrain, and then they can do their chassis work on that, some specifications like this, so, you know, this uh, beach buggy, this could be one example. So it could be something where those electric platforms lead to, uh, to more variety on the car market again. This is, I think, a very interesting, uh, interesting aspect. And um, of course, Volkswagen intend to sell even more platforms just to make more money. On the one hand, to those third party manufacturers to go for some small projects. But on the other hand, you maybe also heard that they are in big business with Ford now because Ford has been like electric platform wise sleeping in the last decades and um, they haven't invested a lot of money in there. And so Ford decided now to take the MEB platform from Volkswagen. That's less expensive for them to take this existing technology. And I think this is probably also the biggest deal in the whole automotive industry at the moment. Because if you think about it, they built this like 10 million times on their own and they sell it for Ford. And if Ford, like also on a massive scale, uses this one for all of their, you know, uh, for all of their mass production cars, this is then, you know, like, then probably half of the cars on the road will be on this very platform. So like when both VW and Ford use it because they both sell in very, very high numbers. This will be very interesting. So, and now getting a little bit closer to those battery packs because you see you have basically like, a, like a, this flat layer. And we talked about passenger cars a lot. We've seen the VW plant there from the commercial vehicles. And this brings me to the point that putting a battery pack here is actually very, very suitable to do it here with a commercial vehicle. Because if you think about the building form of a commercial vehicle, it's somewhat ideal to put a battery pack underneath it. And then if you think about those commercial vehicles that are driving here around town all day, usually they are also, you know, with the short range, especially like um, package deliveries, e-commerce and so on. And this will be a very big thing, which is also reducing local emissions. If they have those light commercial vehicles and make them electric, this will be a very crucial thing to put, you know, to, to reduce your emissions locally here. This is an, um, the e-Sprinter, this would be my Mercedes. The e-Crafter would be the competitor by, by Volkswagen. This is, by the way, also very interesting platform-wise. So far, VW and Mercedes had the same car basically for the Sprinter and the Craft that were working together but they actually split up but then what VW did is they went together with their parent company of MAN which are building the bigger trucks and make the same Crafter version the same segment in this one as the MAN TGE they call it so they basically got a new internal corporation partner to use the very same platform so sometimes those companies split their ways again but usually the bigger trend is that they go, you know, together. You also maybe heard of the, um, of the alliance between um, Mercedes or Daimler and Renault. Um, often leads to comments and car reviews, like, wait, I buy a Mercedes to get a Renault engine? What the hell? But, you know, that's, that's what's happening, at least for the, for, the small, um, for the smaller engines. So more and more alliance, more and more corporations. And I think the electric use of those light commercial vehicles is... Um, this is really important because if you think about old diesels of those inside the cities, those are really you know, um, polluting. And so this, this could be a major cleanup for the cities, especially as the um, e-commerce business is uh, you know, still surging and package deliveries we will still go up and up and up. Um, if you think about even bigger, you know, one of you guys also were uh, working in this segment. This is a big Mercedes star and this is then of course belonging to an even bigger vehicle. This is uh, the first all-electric bus Daimler has been introducing now, the e Citaro, and um, the range here is about 150 or up to 250 kilometers, so that's totally fine for a normal city bus to take the daily route. And then it's also DC charged in the evening again, for example, so this also won't be any problem. And um, especially from the outside, uh, it will be way way um, way more silent inside the city also looks a little bit cooler of course the interior is actually quite equal to the normal combustion um, cars um, yeah we also did some shootings there with the dog to get in and out yeah it's all staged but still looks quite nice right <laughs> yeah there's the dog again um, I think um, it's very important to, especially to have the bigger cars electric inside the city 
because if you think about um, you know how fast should you actually go uh, and what is the real noise difference the biggest noise difference is below 30 kilometers and people might think you know when we all drive electric everything is silent but that's not the case because above a speed of 30 kilometers for passenger cars the tire noise is louder than the noise of the engine and for trucks it's a little bit different there the threshold is a little bit higher so especially for trucks and buses it makes even more sense as for the noise emissions to go electric even more useful than for cars so if you think about um, like a slow traffic environment we have like 30 kilometers an hour as speed limit then the electric cars will reduce noise levels you know, really by a lot if you think about the motorway for example there won't be any difference if you have electric vehicles or the combustion engine cars the noise level from the tire will be absolutely the same so this is about the bus and then what's that big question where and who is that do you know it it's a yeah it's, it's, it's a tesla it's the um the, yeah exactly it's a giga plant um well, they actually claim it's, it's, it's the b biggest, uh, biggest building on Earth. Mm. Then recently, it was, recently um, there was, was in the news uh, that they obviously don't have to you know, enhance the capacity. So I'm not, they're playing for a huge capacity. Then they say, ah, you know, maybe we don't need so much. So let's see how that one is, uh, is going to, to, to be handled. Um, this year, you know, in... Um, Panasonic it was, yeah? Panasonic it was, the corporation. Um, they need, of course, a lot of batteries and they will probably also sell it to other manufacturers. This is also a big topic in the automotive industry at the moment. Can you actually produce something for yourself? The sales, very complicated. You rather rely on, the, like, on Panasonic, LG and, and something there. But can you actually produce the batteries on your own? You know, it's like the sale production and the battery production. And the German manufacturers try to do, you know, they, they buy the cells because it wouldn't be efficient to produce them on your own. But then they want to build the batteries themselves because they then can see how they exactly fit into their vehicles and then put them in. Um, but there's also a lot of political discussion about that now because politicians and also the automotive bosses they see oh when we don't do that ourselves we lose a lot of the profit margin of course and we also lose a lot of power and influence if we buy so much stuff from you know from from those other companies what are they doing the German manufacturers to encounter the um, supercharging by Tesla this is so-called Ionity this is a conglomerate of like BMW Audi, Volkswagen, Ford, Mercedes. So all the German manufacturers, they want to put those supercharging, supercharging stations to the European roads to actually be a good competitor. So far, you don't see so many of those. It's all still announced. They will, of course, build a lot of those. Um, I mean, I think the primary problem of charging is rather that you have something at home or if you're a five-day commuter that you have something at work. But then again, for longer motorway travels or so, it's of course useful to have a um, you know, fast charging station and that's why they're introducing that now. That is again this thing where Tesla is at the moment still far ahead of the competition. If you think about you buy an electric vehicle and you use the motorway quite frequently, what do you do? You cannot rely on this Ionity network yet. This will still take a couple of years to be implemented you know, in a way that you can use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So at the moment, if you're doing like long hauls, in electric vehicle, you would still rely on the Tesla supercharger network. So, yeah, but that's of course all fancy design work they did here. I didn't want to leave that unmentioned. So there is something happening, but um, you have to think about that those classic car companies, they're like, 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 a, like a big ship and until you, you know, turn a big ship, it takes time. And companies like Tesla, they can move, you know, faster, but maybe also do more trial and error. I gave an overview of the German automotive industry, like you know where the plants are headed. We've been looking into some assembly plants, also some insight how the assembly is actually changing from you know, more human focus to this mix of human robot cooperation and on the long term also to a more automatized one. And this will be very interesting when you visit the Ford plant tomorrow, at which stage they are actually at. 
And the last point, the big point from electrification was that also the electric cars are either now built on shared platforms with combustion engine cars or that, for example, as the Volkswagen Corporation does, they use an own electric building platform now for a lot of vehicles to come, also with their shared brands, call it MEB, and this will, yeah, it's one of the biggest things happening in the industry at the moment, this MEB platform, because they built 10 million cars just for that on this very first platform generation. And they will also sell it to third-party manufacturers and also to other big manufacturers like Ford. They have already signed a deal that Ford will also be using this MEB platform. So that's like a very short summary um, what we covered before the break. And we in general had like those four mega trends, which was electrification, connectivity, autonomous driving and sustainability. So electrification was number one. And the second one is connectivity. And the thing is, um, you know, it started with some minor applications. This is like a very short example, you know. This is like the communication between the Apple Watch and the car that you can um, get your information from there to the car. You step in the car and then already that's a, you know, time now work and then you get the car there. And then you also have some technology who, which failed. This one, by the way, was technology of Jaguar Land Rover. They used the so-called in-control apps. You can see it right there. It looks somewhat smartphone-like, uh, but it was no direct connection from your Apple or Android interface. And I was a skeptic about um, this from, 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 from first start, and indeed, it did not work. No one was really using it because it was, was too complicated. Everyone was using their Apple or Android smartphones, and then you also expect just to plug it in, don't install any extra app for that, just plug it in, or maybe nowadays wireless, and then it works. So it did not work for Jaguar Land Rover, they're now also offering CarPlay and Android Auto went the way then. Uh, this one here, the OnStar system, uh, was, been, was offered by Opel, actually not for the future vehicles because they, um, they left the GM corporation, obviously. Um, but this is also something which is, well, they tried to put it to Germany. This is, you know, where I'm having a call now with the OnStar consultant. You can just call and I like, I want to eat some pizza, get me the next restaurant or something. Um, this is a bigger thing in the US where it's those concierge uh, services are used more often in Germany or Europe. Hardly anyone uses it. Um, this came along also with those emergency services, you know. And then you also have, for example, Easter eggs. Like here in the Tesla Model X, that is, um, I think we get the sound here back again. No? There we go. This is the so called Christmas mode. <laughs> and yeah, you can really do it with the car. I once did it in the neighborhood until some, uh, some guy opened the window and was like, shut up down there, what's the <laughs> <laughs> Because um, like the sound the car is giving over the speakers. It's really pretty loud indeed, it's pretty loud, and so the whole environment gets it. And you know, when they do that, the question is, should that be done or, or, or not? Um, I think, you know, why not? So, um, they even have like in the Teslas, in the entertainment system, I'm not sure if you've seen it, like an own branch for Easter eggs. So, um, you, you know, this is the normal map use, but then you have like an own tab for Easter eggs. But this is very interesting because they have really some different approaches. And this direct Google integration, um, no one else has that so far. So they're using the Google Maps and also their, their, their whole system, also satellite view on, on demand, if you like. Um, Volvo will do that now in their Polestar models that they have direct Google integration. That will be the second brand then. All the other manufacturers, they are using sometimes the map services, but nothing else because they don't want to share data with Google. They're sharing data with a lot of other guys, but they don't want to share data with Google. So Tesla doesn't, doesn't care about that that much, but I think the integration is quite well done. It's of course massive, the screen. It has also, also been you know, criticized for that it's maybe too distracting. But then again, you can set it up like once, and then you get all your basic settings. And then you can, for example, just use the steering wheel, um, the controls right there and pick up a phone or something and you just leave the screen aside. Because, you know, uh, when you look at it while driving, it is indeed distracting, so you should not do that. But the whole idea, of course, and I mean, like, it was the way in the Tesla Model S already in 2012, 
and you know five six years after that nothing came now you know manufacturers and the other ones are picking up slowly for example this is also one of the biggest assets so you just park your car and then you say hey, you know this night i'll do the next software update so your car does not remain old as it was when buying it like 99 percent of all other vehicles it's updated then this is the separated uh, easter egg tab where you can also have like this rudolph reindeer mode or uh, some other visualizations um, yeah it's really funny or the cowbell mode so um i mean you, you can offer a lot of things there this is then when you just use the, the digital instruments but i think the main thing is really that this car can be updated and um, other manufacturers are now starting to implement it slowly and this one by the way was also something that happens while testing um, the screen is not flickering in real life, it's just on camera by the way, but here in this case the screen got stuck and then you, for example you, you, have to, you need to know how to restart a Tesla because you can't do anything, you know, you cannot like you know, shut it off with a normal knob or so and here you have to um, hold the buttons at the same time and then you can actually restart the system because you know, like with the computer you just put the reset button but there is no real reset button, you need like some hotkeys to press it and then I need to, had, had to restart the Tesla and then it was working again. So, but this also of course shows somewhat the risk if the car is just, you know, completely a computer. It comes with a lot of pros but also probably with some cons. Also if you think about the safety for autonomous driving, we'll soon get to that. Of course you know, everyone knows the computer can also get hacked. The manufacturers always claim that they have repetitive systems to prevent that from happening but there were also like some showcases of some hacker students or so who broke into those systems. So um, it does work. Everyone knows that. So yeah, again, no, nothing black and white. In this case, white. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then the next step was the Tesla Model 3 where they put the screen a little bit more separate in the middle part. No instrument actually. So the screen is, uh, the speed is displayed on the left top on the screen that you can somewhat still relate to it from your line of sight. I mean they reduce to the max, they also want to reduce cost that they can offer this model here at a lower price. But again the basic system again is clear that this car is somewhat a fixed hardware but then the software will develop from time to time and if you look at the Tesla configurator and look at it a couple of weeks later you will always see some changes. The Tesla Model 3 by the way if you want to um, get the build of those I mean, you can change the exterior color, you can change the interior color and the battery capacity, that's it. So they try to really keep the production also simple from the, um, for, from the equipment you get inside and to reduce the option list. And that's also what we see now with the Mercedes EQC recently. Um, Mercedes where you can always have like 300 different options. With the electric car they also try to reduce the option list to make the production for them more efficient to be able to offer the electric cars also at a more reasonable price, more or less. That's also the other interesting trend. And that would be the more, you know, let's say, classic integration now, CarPlay connection just via cable. Um, in this case here, that was a Hyundai Kona and the normal infotainment system was not really that good. There's even no GPS in this car, no, no navigation system. And they just said, you know, we don't have a big good navigation system anyway and it costs like still a lot of extra price. So people just use the CarPlay integration and that's it. And I mean, you can also understand that when you have a good web connection, that's also helpful and you can just you, use your integrated maps for the Apple CarPlay or the Android Auto. Usually nowadays with the cable connection, by the way, um, BMW were the first one to offer the wireless CarPlay connection. And now also the Volkswagen Corporation is catching up and the new Audis and the new Volkswagen, for example now with the Passat facelift that is coming up, driving that next, no, next month. And the new big Audis, they are also featured that you also have the wireless uh, CarPlay. The question is, all, it makes somewhat sense when you also have an inductive charging platform, then you can you know, just enter the car, put it on the inductive charging platform, then you have the wireless connection. If you don't have an inductive charging platform, well, then you can also just say, why not use your cable? Because then you're charging and have the data connection at the very same time. And then you also have some, um, it's also an interesting small story with Toyota, because they're offering CarPlay and Android Auto in the US, but not in the EU yet. And sometimes it's even about just some 
minor parts. Sometimes it's more about the licensing issue. Obviously, they weren't like that far in the uh, you know in, in the talks with the licensing, so they don't offer it for the EU yet. And then I asked them like, is it possible to retrofit it when you, when you when you buy a car now? And they said actually no, because as they didn't offer the function for you, for for the EU. They also put another USB device in the car, so like you know, the it's not like an upgraded USB port which also transfers data. It just transfers <coughs> energy, and so they actually would need to change the USB plug hardware, probably because it's like you know two cents less in the production than the other one that also could transport data. So when they said like when you buy a Toyota now and expect that, probably in the EU you cannot retrofit it. Yeah. So that's also another example of, you know, where they try to save money with some minor parts. Another good example from the non-connectivity world is, by the way, a lot of the new small cars, they don't have those, you know, like, like, like uh, holes from, from the inside on, on, the, on, the in, on the ceiling. Because they say, yeah, we ask our customers and seven out of ten customers says we never used that, so they got rid of it. And that maybe saves like a euro or two with the car, but if they build like this platform of a car, like a couple of million times, then they of course save a couple of million in production. So that's, that's also very interesting. So um, yeah, I mean connectivity wise, um, one very recent trend is also that we have the voice activation or voice recognition and with the um, new Mercedes MBUX, this is actually quite well done. Then you can also use it like for set temperature to 22 degrees or driving to Berlin Central Station, that's working quite, quite well. Also in the BMWs, so those two I see at the moment leading the market right there. Mm, in the Audi is also quite okay, maybe a little bit behind that one. Um, <coughs> I think especially with the Mercedes solution, you have a little bit more natural voice input. You don't have to follow a certain fixed system. And um, all the other systems that were in place, for example, Ford has been offering it for quite a while, but then you really have to read, read the screen and exactly say the word that the screen suggests to go to the next step. And the ultimate goal is, of course, that you just have a free speech, so to say, in whichever exact way you say it or in which order, and the car really recognizes it. And I think that's especially helpful for putting in like a GPS address, because if you remember like those ways where you have to like use the turning of like A, C, H, and then, oh. so like this is really good, helpful for the, for the voice input then. So, and then we come back to the autonomous driving, and I said initially, this one, a very famous ride um, by me in 2013, where no one was regulating Tesla in Germany yet, and they just handed out test vehicles where I could use the, the, auto, um, uh, the, the autopilot function without any punishment, and you'll soon see me taking off my hands over from the steering wheel again. Today, in every vehicle, it would not be allowed, and the vehicle, after like, you know, 20 seconds or so, would say, don't do, don't do this, put your hands on the steering wheel again. At this time, this warner was not activated yet. It has to be from regulations right now. And this was also the time where you found those very stupid YouTube videos where people were getting on the back seat of a Tesla uh, while being on the motorway and saying, I'm so cool, I'm filming myself on the back seat of Tesla while no one is driving the car. Yeah, after one, one guy died and then they changed the regulation, there it is. So, and you saw basically that already a couple of years ago, the autonomous driving was theoretically possible, especially in a more or less controlled environment like here on the motorway. So on the motorway, they actually have the least problems you know, in recognizing like where are these certain lines and so on. And the more crowded and the more complex it gets in the city, you know, the more complex it also gets for the autopilot. So again, don't do that at home, kids. <laughs> so it, it, I mean, it, it's still, even the Tesla will not allow it, so it will, um, and then give a warning and take your um, hands on the steering and if not then at some point the car decelerates and comes to a stop that's how the systems uh, nowadays work um, and it's it's really strange that somehow we know like already a couple of years ago this was possible and then if you ask the expert on, on the autonomous driving like when are we really driving autonomously they're saying like yeah maybe in four or five years we start to be able to have an autonomous drive without you inside a parking lot. It's like, okay. So it's like, you know, the theory from the, from the practical approach is like really miles away. This one, another interesting thing, um, in the, in the E-Class, that was already uh, also a couple of years ago where they introduced the new assistance systems family for, for those. 
for example, for also for an automatic or semi-autonomous lane change. And um, even with those, so the question is, when are you upgrading those system, systems and when are new regulations taking place? For example, BMW lost their ability to do an autonomous lane change in Europe because they upgraded their system. Mercedes did not. And they still have this special permit to do that. So the EU regulation changed, they became stricter, allowing less, but if you already had the allowance to do so, you can still do it, but if you make your system better, you're not allowed to do it anymore. That's really strange. So we have done sometimes in our reviews when I test a BMW and say, okay, this autonomous lane change now is allowed in the US, that's why we're showing it at the moment, but it's, you will not get this feature in Europe because it's not allowed. Yeah, um, it's different, by the way, for example, with headlights, those laser headlights, uh, 600 meters of range, high beam range. In Europe, it's allowed. In the US, it's limited to 300. So no one has the use of buying laser headlights in the US, but a lot of them still do, because then you get a blue accentuation in the headlights for $300,000 extra. That would be the main reason to go for it then. Um, yeah, so um, in the E-Class, the assistance systems are also pretty much evolved. Um, the, you know, the biggest use case is today that you are just you know, using the steering wheel and then accelerating and braking from the, from the uh, uh, um, ACC, the Adaptive Cruise Control is being done. That you can also leave off the steering wheel, again, that's not allowed anywhere yet, just in some prototype or test cases. Here I'm just doing it again for show purposes to see like that it works, but after a while the car would again then say, please take your hands on the steering wheel. And you might also have heard of those different levels of autonomous driving, one, two, three, four, five. And zero would of course be just doing nothing. One would be that one way, so either steering wheel or the brake pedal is being used. Two would be that both is actually somewhat assisted, so steering and accelerating or braking. Three, we're not there yet, we're actually at level two at the moment, because level three of autonomous driving would be that you actually can, in certain situations, let the car over, like, overtake all the job. So, for example, on a motorway use, steering wheel is uh, retracted, and then the car is also responsible. That's the thing about autonomous driving. So as, when it's level three, in some parts the car is responsible, because then when the car would be having an accident in the autonomous drive mode, it would not be your responsibility. That's the, the big thing. And level four would then be altogether working. You know, you can drive fully autonomously, but maybe not in like certain regions where the mapping doesn't work or whatever. And level five would then be everywhere without any limitations whatsoever. So Volvo is also having uh, their assistance systems right there, for example, with an animal det detection, because that's also the question like, um, Depending on those systems, they only realize animals at a certain th size. For example, like a dog, yes, a cat, no. Um, that's, of course, a problem. Um, it also depends a little bit on the height. I also once did a test with the remote parking of a BMW 5 Series, where you can use the key to drive the car. And I just put a plastic bag, or like a, like a paper bag, in front of the car. And once the car ran over the bag, and the second time it was stopping, because you now the bag was like that high, and that's not always enough, so, but if it's like that high, it's enough. So it depends on how the sensors are calibrated and how, um, you know, how well they're actually working. And of course, also which sensors are you working? The most common um, is, is radar. That's, everyone is using that for the ACC or uh, camera-based systems. Subaru, for example, is mainly using camera-based systems. Um, they are a little bit more exact in a way when you have good visibility. When you have bad visibility, they are less good. So then radar is good, better. And sometimes manufacturers try to combine them. Radar plus camera, that's also pretty common to make it more exact. And then there's laser sensors, so LiDAR. This is also in a way very exact, but it's very expensive. And Mercedes, for example, says that they, are, they will actually, you know, they want to use all of the sensors available in the future to make it really you know, capable of fully autonomous driving on a very high level. Elon Musk recently said he wants not to use any laser technology because it's too expensive. He used it for, the, for his rockets, 
but not for the cast. So he's really relying on the camera plus the sensors. And he's also saying, you know, they, they recently had a big pres presentation there because they want to um, uh, rely on, on, on a neural network. So they rather use a lot of data to process from the camera. And together with this collected data, they want to make the camera system as reliable as it would be with some additional sensors. So different approaches there. We'll have to see, you know, what's, what's really happening, what's really working in the future. And the manufacturers have different approaches than to include it in whole vehicle concepts. And there are a lot of concepts on the market, but you'll see now different concepts from different manufacturers. This is, uh, um, uh, I think, F01, I think it was called, or F, F, no, F15, whatever. It was a Mercedes concept. And you see the basic form of like this long wheelbase. You've seen also in the MEB platform we've shown you earlier, long wheelbase, hardly any front hood that stands over, so you have a lot of space on the interior. And what you also see that is a common trend to create this living room atmosphere, that you go away from, this is a car interior, so they rather build from the inside out to see, this is like a living room to feel cozy in, listen to music, talk to your friends and so on, of course, while being driven autonomously. Here in this case, you see that you can also flip the chairs to be able to talk. This one would be the driving mode again. This uh, rather concept which shows a transition where you can still drive yourself, but also can let the car drive itself on demand. And this is also one way to do it. They, of course, take a very round design approach with their uh, design. The design scheme at Mercedes is called Central Purity, by the way where they try to be a little bit clean, but and then again also with some swinging lines. And um, they don't want really to hear it, but of course they're targeting the Asian markets for that. So because now in the, in, in the Asian market trends, they use more round and central lines, whereas the European overall design trend is, whole, is, is quite often like very angular, angular, strict, a little bit cleaner. And I mean, it's personal preference, but it's also a little bit due to market specification. And this would be some example of the interior. Um, of course, they exaggerate it here and there a little bit, but the overall theme is that the interior of a car also more becomes a whole infotainment system, more like a cinema experience or so. There are also approaches that when you're like with four or five people in the car and everyone um, gets their phone and the car is realizing, oh, which music are you guys listening to? And then the car is actually mixing the music preferences to fit like one certain song, which maybe everyone likes. <laughs> so um, this is very, very interesting approaches here. Um, in this mode here, by the way, you cannot see what's going on on the outside. It's basically like a shaded mode and you have the, the screen all the way from the inside. Um, so that's how they think the future could look like. Um, I'm not sure if it, if it will be the, that case, but the question of course remains when we drive all autonomously at some point. Well, there is, of course, more free time in the car. And again, what's the time horizon for that? For this? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what can you do as a manufacturer and what are you actually allowed to. So because some regulations also say that this is not allowed, this is not allowed, it has to be, again, you know, more safety tests. And then, of course, the highest stage of autonomous driving can probably only be reached if there are more autonomous cars on the road overall. If there's also this car to car communication, if there's car to X communication, X to car communication, maybe also together with traffic lights and so on. So I'm not sure if we talk about a single year uh, figure here, at least as for the classic manufacturers. And then you suddenly have an Elon Musk saying like, oh, next year we drive fully autonomously. And everyone's like, like <whistles> until probably he proves otherwise. So. The thing is, with Elon Musk, um, besides Tesla going private, that was not really true. But other than that, all the other announcements he made so far, they usually became true, but not exactly when he planned to, but like two or three years later. So um, I think Tesla will be driving autonomously first. I'm quite certain about that, if they still exist by then as a, as a company. Totally different company. Ease go, let's go, however I want to call it, from by Renault. But you see, totally different company, but they still have somehow, mm, you know, you still see the same concept, you know, like the building platform, because they more again thought about how can people feel at ease, you know, 
also with this wide open and it can make it basically almost dr drive into the vehicle of the uh, itself and then again with the concentration on infotainment and stuff um, but I wonder, I mean, if you would drive an autonomous vehicle, would you rely on the multimedia system of the car or would you just get your smartphone out or your own laptop or tablet or something? Um, they, of course, want to offer their own multimedia solutions too. But I think maybe it would make more sense also to offer more integration level, you know, because I've also seen it like with, I'm not even going in detail on multimedia systems um, um, of luxury vehicles anymore because now those integrated screens, so no one ever uses them. They get their own iPads or own smartphones in the car and uses those, you know, because you have all your data on there. People usually don't spend their, the time and effort to get it transported into a, an external separate car multimedia system. I'm not sure if that's also what, what's happening with that. You see that um, we also get to a transition period there of what is still personal car and what is some kind of minibus or something. Um, there are also some first prototype phases with that on, you know, controlled ground. And on the one hand, people say, come on, let's use more public transportation, also better for the environment and so on. And on the other hand, you have the trend that we will get those autonomous vehicles. And this could also be a form of future public transportation. Maybe this will even reduce the overall big public transportation if you have those mini bus ideas. Because when they are always available and you know you can use them very well, maybe they're not that expensive. So they also aim that this kind of transportation will be even cheaper than taxis, of course, and probably even, uh, oh, that's an advertisement, um, probably even cheaper than uh, Uber or Lyft. And this one would be one that is already driving, that's on the continental, it's like one of the biggest um, automotive suppliers worldwide. This is their testing ground near Frank Road. And well, they buy the chassis from a, from a French manufacturer, but then they implement their technology. This, again, could be something, you know, they could use in cities with those minibuses. This would be the closest user case for those autonomous parking. That's what everyone um, is suggesting would, will come even a little bit earlier, earlier than in those, because for those you really need an own infrastructure. For example, this one here, they have also, uh, you know, um, basically the hardware around the testing ground. So it's not that this small minibus is driving totally on its own. It knows where its track is. It knows where it can go on a maximum level. So it needs somehow, um, let's say, external sensors. And that's a big, big topic overall. Do you just rely on internal sensors? And that's, for example, Tesla's approach. They say, we use those camera systems we have. We, we use, use the neural network, the, the fleet intelligence, they gather the information from all of the different vehicles and have a standalone solution. And then there are other solutions which say, yeah, you know, we also use external hardware, for example, use an intersection, have um, like a connecting um, um, a dot there on, on, on intersection or at traffic lights, and then it communicates with those vehicles. And some say that the fully autonomous driving will only be possible if you also have external hardware, so like street infrastructure for the autonomous driving. Elon Musk says no, don't need that. <laughs> so we'll see about um, who is right as for that, it's, but definitely very interesting. So I also took a test ride in that one. Um, it also has an autonomous braking function, but it also doesn't go that fast. So it's not, a, let's say, a real scenario where I could say this would really help you being transported inside the city. It just goes too slow for that. That's, by the way, what the car sees. So it's quite interesting always to see um, how is this, this image or how is this uh, simulated world made up for the, for, for the vehicle. And that again depends on the sensor. So if it's made up by cameras, it's quite equal to the things we see. If it's radar based, like this one here primarily, it's different. Right? You see something like this. Um, it's also interesting that the, the recent um, Mercedes upgrade for the ACC is that it also uses the map data and also, for example, traffic jam data. So, for example, when it sees, oh, there's a traffic jam ahead, then it's reducing already the speed when you're going very fast, that you're basically, like, you know, already a little bit slower, and then it can apply your brakes on your own. We had this BMW i8 Spider concept um, first. For BMW, it's, of course, very important because they have this, like, you know, the driving pleasure identity that you can still drive the car on your own. When BMW says, 
you're not allowed, allowed to drive anymore, then all customers would crucify them. So here you have basically both, and then you maybe like have a conference call, the steering wheel retracts, you have this conference call again, and when the call is finished and you feel like enjoying the drive again, then you can start driving again on your own. So this would be one user case where you also have to transition between you know, being able to do both. Um, because you know, a lot of car customers, they have a problem when they hear, oh, I cannot drive myself anymore. We know at the end of the day, it will probably happen. The question is also, um, when we now think like 20, 30 years ahead, if we somehow get to a point where we say that autonomous vehicles are almost flawless, they create no accidents, while we have like you know, 50,000 dead people on the, on the streets by human error, then you ask yourself, is my right to drive myself more important than the life of 50,000 or 100,000 people? And I think when we get to this point, then it, you know, probably there will be even laws or people demanding laws that uh, self-driving will be forbidden. But that's, you know, I think a rather a question of decades, not of the, um, of the next years. Of course, I'm just saying that, you know, from a, like, from a basic, you know, common sense. I, of course, I, me, myself, I like to drive the car. But I think sometimes you also have to think about you know, what's, what's right for whole society. Same with, with speed limits. I like to drive 160 on an autobahn, but I know it's crazy. So, um, you, know, so you have to always have to take in mind like, what you like to do personally, but what would be better for, for the common sense. This is also interesting, by the way. Um, this was a system they presented also a while ago. Uh, what about charging, first of all, and autonomous also in the, um, you know, in, in the parking surrounding? We had that before. But then also combined with charging, because when we say, um, talk about converging technologies, it could be inductive charging. That was the first case now. So you get on the box where there's an inductive charging platform, like for a smartphone. Problem is you have a lot of energy loss there. Then this would be another solution that you have a cable, but you don't have to put it in yourself. There is a robot arm that puts in the cable. So this is another solution. Um, I mean, it looks a little bit complicated. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, the sense is that, of course, no humans are around there, that you just leave your uh, car at the entrance of the parking lot, and then it's being parked autonomously and charged autonomously at the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the, the Terminator parking lot. <coughs> the inductive charging would be some more, you know, looks a little bit easier in this case on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, again, you know, inductive charging has a lot of power loss overall. So the question is, what is the best solution there overall? Mm, it's, it's really hard to say. Then we also include in our lecture, of course, yeah, the, um, the commercial vehicles. Um, and there's also another um, example of how technologies can also fail. And so the first part of that is that you can theoretically have an autonomous truck that's already in a pilot phase in the US um, with the freight liners. And then the second idea of, of Daimler was to use this platooning function that you have like one autonomous truck or car in the front and the other ones, they are just platooning behind the car. So you have like an, a row of three or five or, or six trucks. And actually just like this year at CES, they announced that they would cancel this project because it would not pay off. It's, there's no use case for that, for the platooning. Um, because it's too complicated, it's too expensive, no one would really do it. It's not so many cases where five or six truck, trucks drive exactly behind each other with this very same um, location goal, very same destination. And also the technology that is involved there would not really pay off for the customer because, you know, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> at some point um, someone has to pay for it and someone needs to see like, like a benefit for that, you know. And, um, it only pays off when you can really um, save a lot of money with it. Um, or if it's way safer. This one here, for example, also for the emergency braking. Um, what they also thought is that the um, amount of fuel you save with platooning would be greater than it actually is. So like driving in this wind shadow of the other truck, it's not as efficient as they thought out to be. So this is also an example of that they try to induce, uh, introduce a technology, but it sometimes say, you know, it's not that useful, so let's not do it. Um, lane change, indeed, as I said, as long as you stay in your own lane, it's rather simple. As soon as you try to change lanes or change direction, then it gets more complicated with all the systems um, you really need and you need to use. And this is also possible already with the trucks, but um, 
again a future use case what is more to reality at the moment is that all the big trucks they get those um, uh, you know when, when they are in intersections they get a warning for example in the side mirror and they also um, that they have like the pedestrian and cyclist um, um, warning this is actually even more important because people are regularly getting getting killed uh, because you know it's a truck driver and when you turn right or at an intersection and the bicyclist or you cannot see them it's just not possible to see them from from, from most angles and therefore those warnings are, are really really very important this is by the way also um, a test track in germany so very, very very famous one i've been driving that one too it looks like a motorway but it isn't really it's like an like an own test track so i mean um when first of those videos were released, there was also a lot of discussion like are all um, truck drivers jobless now? But again, this takes more, more years and maybe the truck driver gets an, a different kind of job in the car then. Back to the Tesla stuff, because this is now also a very interesting aspect. They want to do their autonomous driving, yes, but they also want to combine it with the right hauling. So they at the same time want to be competitive to, uh, to Lyft or Uber. And they say, okay, you, you buy your Tesla and then you can earn back money by basically renting your car autonomously. So you send your car to work and they calculate that you can make like thirty to $40,000 by that per year and your car would already pay off. And the trick is that only with a Tesla you can use their special app. So that's, that's the thing. And they even they are even so convinced of that system that they said now they will cancel the program that you lease a car and then buy it later so you can either buy a tesla now and keep it or if you lease it they want the car back because they want their own cars back then afterwards because they want to use it for their lyft uber fleet and this was you know how their app is going to look like so it's a very very interesting approach also, the other manufacturers, um, for example, the uh, Volkswagen is testing a project it's called Moya. They're using the T6 as some ride holding services. They have um, some prototype phase in Hamburg at the moment, but now already facing some problems as for regulations um, because the taxi companies are fighting against it in the taxi lobbyist groups. Um, and now they have like a restriction for the number of vehicles. Um, there was a recent verdict against them. Um, on long term run, of course, this has to be also allowed, this ride hauling, because it can massively change how city traffic is being organized. Um, you've just maybe seen that um, Daimler retracted Smart, they're very small vehicles from the Northern American market. And I also think that mini microcars don't have any future, not because they wouldn't be useful, they, they are super useful for the, for the city, definitely. But the thing is, with this ride hauling, I mean, when you're at the point deciding, do I get a micro car to be able to find a parking spot or do I have a car available 24 seven by my smartphone anyway, then you probably will not buy a car at all, no matter the size. And you would just use a ride hauling app and will drive with Uber, Lyft or their Tesla, Uber or whatever, or whoever is offering that service. And that again makes also some chances again, but also problems for the manufacturers because when less and less people need to own the vehicles, you can sell less vehicles, it will more about be not ownership, but more the usage of the vehicles. So you can always have a vehicle on demand uh, and you don't need to own it necessarily. Talked about the Tesla sensor approach. This is a good example here, for example, here where usually there would be two objects for, for the car, for the camera system, but then they collect their fleet data information and the fleet says, you know, I've seen that like a hundred or thousand times and they were always moving together at the same speed and then the bike was not going sideways. So this is obviously for my computer brain now, this is a car, here yeah, we can see different examples. This is a car with a bicycle attached to it. And then the car learns from that. And so by that, the software automatically updates itself and every single vehicle is learning then from that. Or here, they even claim when you know their fleet have experienced like 500,000 cut-ins like this, they say they can even predict when a car will be cutting in, just from you know how it was moving before, and then the um, autopilot can even somewhat you know act in advance a little bit, or maybe reduce the speed because they oh how the car is driving there in the front. In most of the situations, this vehicle will be cutting into the left right now, so we all reduce the speed. 
So very interesting approach with this, um, you know, with this neural network and you can, you can think of it a little bit like a Google Pixel picture search. That's approximately the system they have behind it. They also installed a big new um, processor behind it. They claim it would be the fastest one. Then Nvidia came out like, oh, we have the fastest one. So yeah, they're upgrading their computer brains in there definitely. And they claim this is okay with camera and radar. And they don't need the laser sensor additionally for it because their neural network, their learning system from the data they have available from the whole fleet data would be that good that they don't need the laser sensor to be able to um, you know, um, offer it also at a, at a better stage. Very interesting. So we'll see what, what, what's, what's to come there. Then an Audi approach to a recent uh, concept vehicle is this one. And again, we see the basic building platform, no matter which manufacturer you take, it seems to be like this. Um, I mean, from an aesthetics perspective, we have to get used to it. Because usually when you say, you know, like a beautiful car, it usually has this long, powerful hood, and then maybe it has like a central cabin in the rear, taking a Jaguar E-Type or so, which a lot of people take as a, like the design icon. But those electric or semi-autonomous vehicles, they usually combine this very big cabin space then with short overhangs, because it just makes sense in a way. Again, you see this rather living room approach, which you can also understand because if you would plan your living room like a normal car interior is at the moment, I mean, who would like to sit down there, you know, like a normal car seat, who would put that on the dining, dining table? It doesn't make so much sense. So it's um, interesting to take the, the approach the other way around. And again, here with those retracting features, maybe you can use this then for, for foods and drinks or so, while the steering wheel is not out. And of course, so far it's very important to them that they still keep somewhat their, their ability to drive the car yourself, um, especially because you don't want to, you know, they also want to take it somewhat slowly. Um, or at some point also, I, I picked this one also as an example because this one is now, um, you know, really different approach. Um, I'm not even sure if you can call it car. Um, because this one is it's rather thought, for example, emergency situations or maybe even for space. Um, you see, it has like those different joints where you can tackle different terrains. Of course, also then autonomous vehicle, it has this walk mode. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's re really interesting. Um, I mean, why not giving those thoughts? Um, you'll soon also see the visualization of why they thought about that, because when they think about that, well, this is like a military use. Um, but also like an emergency um, use uh, for, for example, for, for earthquakes. So this could also be a new use for, um, for, for um, uh, emergency situations. This is concept by, by Hyundai, by the way. So very interesting in this case. Well, or maybe for the next trip to Mars with uh, one of Elon Musk's rockets. This is now by Volvo, another concept, again with this, well, not living room rather than bedroom atmosphere. This is the idea that you start your car, maybe go like, like an overnight flight across Atlantic. You would just do it in a car wherever you want to go and you go to sleep and you wake up and you arrive at the next destination. Um, yeah, with seat belts and so on, this is of course critical somewhat. Mm, I think Sleeping in your car probably can only work when you also have like the other um, cars communicating to each other because as soon as you have like some manual cars on the road, you have also more unpredicted situations and then probably you will, you know, <laughs> fall out of the car uh, when you're uh, um, sleeping there. But you can see there are also solutions that you're also being kept tight with seat belts also when sleeping. So, yeah, but I think also again, an interesting approach and especially Volvo as a Scandinavian manufacturer um, because they have like this Scandinavian furniture, interior design, here for example with the grey fabric. <coughs> so a very stylish approach. Again, to make the car more than something that just gets you from A to B, but more like a you know, yeah, place where you feel at home, maybe you want to go to sleep or get your work done um, or, or whatever. You can see how they flip up the bed basically. So it really reminds us rather at like, you know, like with business class on an airline or so. Would you like to drive in one of these? Yeah, you too? Yeah. 
Yeah? I mean, it looks quite cozy, right? Well, you're not driving. Exactly, you're not driving. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, maybe you can take your autonomous uh, drive um, to the next racetrack and then drive your race car there and, uh, and, and really let it fly. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so um, it's always um, also a question of generations, for example. So you, you really see that like the older the people get, the more reserved they are also towards autonomous driving. And younger people, they sometimes say like, oh, you know, I don't even have a driver's license. Why would I have a smartphone so I can call like, a, like an Uber or Lyft at any time I want anyway? So why do I even need to own a car? I'm more interested that I get the most recent smartphone, for example. So um, we still see, of course, young car enthusiasts. But definitely there's a trend, I mean like uh, when I was like 16 or 18 and first chance you could get like the driver's license for different driving class. It's like, you know, the day it was your birthday you had the driver's license and that's it. There was no exception, you know. But nowadays like when I talk to like some people like getting 18 or something, yeah, maybe I'll do the driver's license next year, maybe not, maybe in two years. Um, I took half of the classes and Maybe I do another class next week, or maybe not. So and it's like it doesn't play such a big role, you know. At least when you are in a city. So if you're more in the rural uh, areas, it still plays a big role, and there's no like big alternative um, arising yet. But especially because and more and more people are living inside the cities, and then owning a car um, themselves gets gets less and less um, important, definitely. Maybe for. Um, for this uh, topic, any more questions? Autonomous driving? Or, yeah. uh, you, you mean um, you mean that you just order a driver instead of ordering technology? Yeah, I guess or? Like two dollars, I don't know, mm. a year or whatever, going great for someone. Yeah. Mm. Like a Gran Turismo style thing. Yeah. <laughs> ah, ah, you mean you mean remote? That someone. You, you mean that someone remotely controls your car from like like a call center in India or so? Like, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, I mean I mean those this time like with military drones for example, right? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting approach. So um, I mean I think that could indeed be more economical uh, than applying all the technology, but probably the people will be even more scared. I mean, if you ask the people, well, what, what would you prefer? That, uh, you know, someone from a call center in India drives your car or that the car is like a, a dri self-driving robot itself? I think, I'm not sure. I, I think I'm, people would rather trust either on themselves directly or on the full machine, you know, because when I say, when they think about, you know, someone else is driving a car because, you know, you know people, they are always themselves the very best drivers in the whole world. And everyone else is not able to drive a vehicle. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure if they would really trust in them. So, um, Interesting. I mean, that's the same thing as Uber, though. You're calling a stranger to drive a car. Yeah, car. yeah. Oh. But you see the stranger. Yeah, you see the stranger. Yeah. Just put them up on the screen. So you can see them all the time. I probably trust some kid that had grown up on Gran Turismo all the time. Oh, yeah. I play video games. Really yeah. <laughs> you know that uh, scene from uh, Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he's driving this um, cab, where it's like a like a how is how is it called again? It's like a they the they have, cab. Yeah, 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 the robot. Like break the robot out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but it's really interesting aspect. Really interesting aspect. So um, yeah. Yeah. So so um, platooning was. Um, I mean, it's something they want to offer to their customers, and then they realize no one would actually pay for it, and they also would have no serious financial gain for that. You know, I think so. That's that's the problem. Um, uh, we've we've talked about over lunch um, also about uh, train systems, for example. So uh, you know, we had this uh, very famous uh, trans rapid system here, the ma magnetic train, which is like actually the at the moment the best form of transportation overall, and the fastest and the safest one. Um, and it would totally make sense to put those magnetic rails all over the country if you didn't have the existing infrastructure. So in this case, like the best technology, which makes totally sense, is not applied because of something is already existing. It would be too uneconomical, too cost intensive to rip all the uh, rails, the standard rails apart and then replace a new one. So um, indeed, it's, it's, it's quite often not a question of what's the best technology or um, 
uh, I think it recently had like 25th anniversary or something, the Concorde, this, um, you know, the uh, Mach 2 plane. Um, was it Mach 1 or Mach, Mach 1? I think, one, two, one, yeah, something like in between, yeah. Uh, it's like uh, London or Paris, New York in three hours. And it was like, like, wow, everyone would buy that nowadays, you know, just pay a little bit more money. But um, yeah, it crashed, yes. That was, of course, one, you know, thing why they didn't use it anymore, but that was not the main reason. I mean, it's obviously better to go to New York in three hours than in six or seven hours, but it was just not the business case. So they could only fly transatlantic for everything else. They couldn't use it because it was too loud. So you cannot fly over normal countries with that. Um, the most thing where planes are being used is, you know, inside the US overland. So you can, can use it there and build a plane just for a transatlantic use. Uh, then at a like niche customer market who pay a lot of money, that was just not a, not a business case. So um, there again, great technology. Nowadays we have to go longer over translating anymore because it was just not you know paying off, even if it was a very interesting technology. So that's I think a very good examples for that not always. Or for example, laser technology. If if it's true, but what Elon Musk is predicting, laser technology is probably one of the best sensors we have. But then again, maybe it will not be used because it's too expensive for the very use, at least now. Maybe it will you know, change at another point or so. You know? so but it's very interesting uh, because we always think that you know, as, uh, when a technology is the best, it prevails, period. But that's obviously not the case. Yeah. I had a question on the connectivity part. You said that like Audi, BMW, Mercedes, they were all doing their own voice recognition. Have you seen any of them partner with like a Google or Amazon to do full integration? Because I haven't, all I've seen is like Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, they mind, I mean, those ones are most prevailing. Uh, BMW still doesn't offer Android, by the way. Um, you know, I have some talks about that. They say officially, mm, <coughs> Yeah, we don't want to share data with Google. That's always a little bit. But then again, I mean, which data are they not sharing with Apple then? So, I mean, it doesn't make a big difference. So it will probably be in BMW soon, but at the moment they don't have it yet. Um, but the, you know, like, like the full Google or Google Maps integration, you just have it with Tesla. And now also like the, the Polestar, so the electric Volvos, they are, they are getting it. Um, but the rest of the manufacturers, they try to split it a little bit because they want to be like king of their data somehow. That's the, that's the main reason for that. Um, yeah, with, with, with Tesla, I mean, um, they just have a different philosophy there. You know, they, they did it also like as a unique selling point and that worked also, um, was that a bird or something? I hope not, I hope not. Well, um, yeah, but um, what's, what's also interesting as for the map collaboration, this is also something you see that um, in, in a lot of fields where <coughs> Mercedes and BMW or Audi were just like working separately before, they're now working together. For example, they're sharing the same map services. So they also like build something like a joint venture where they then know that everyone has to develop their own map stuff. So they are um, saving costs by that. This is also like one example where they're exactly uh, uh, already working together. Or also with their um, car sharing services, where um, Mercedes and BMW merged their ones now. So it was, the BMW part was first the um, half owned by Sixth, it's a re big rental company here. So and then they bought the part from Sixth to be able then to merge it with the Mercedes, because especially with car sharing, which is again, ride, uh, ride hauling is the one you order on your smartphone, then you get someone else who's coming to you. And the um, car sharing is that you drive yourself the car in the city. And this can only be profitable if you have like a big fleet and you have a big availability and you have like just like a certain scale. And therefore they merge it together because only when you like you go out of your house and you have the next car in like walking distance of one or two minutes then it's okay for you. Everything else above that you can forget it. No one will use it. So the, there's always a question like what is first supply and demand? In um, case of car, uh, car sharing, uh, you have to first offer the supply to be able to you know, get the demand. You know. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's just an excuse, but the manufacturers um, always say that they don't want to work with Google. Um, well, most of them do with meanwhile, you know, but not in a like full integration like Tesla does. But most of them just said that they don't want to share the data with them. So. Um, 
they um, I mean, there, there are some like li licensing issues, you know, there are some, they have some contracts and then there's agreed like who gets access to which data. And obviously in some cases they couldn't really ag agree on those. This, yeah. I'm not sure, I mean, um, the, um, the answer to that is also to me somehow a little bit strange because I can't imagine that the um, licensing, pa licensing part would be way different than the one they do with Apple, you know, so I'm um, not sure about that. But I mean, at some point, um, I mean, Android is even stronger in the market than, than Apple. If you, I mean, Apple is rather a niche smartphone, you know, if you look, everyone knows it, you know, and some, some are like cool and stuff. And, but if you look at the global sales of, you know, like Android smartphones and Apple smartphones, Android is clearly prevailing. You know, so they also BMW has to um, accept, that, accept that, yeah. Yeah, Google Waymo is, um, is also very interesting. So um, there has been like, um, like, two or three years ago, everyone was saying like, oh, now Google and Apple are developing their own car. And then they are flooding the market with that, with autonomous drive and so on. And um, I think it's, I think that they don't build their own car because they also don't see a business model. So if Google looks at their business model, I mean, they have, um, if you compare it with a car company, you know, a car company has massive turnover, massive amount of turnover. But in comparison to the turnover, just little profits, of course, they're still making big money, but if you then look at the Google share or what they have a turnover and profit because they're not selling like hardware products. So you can just get more money out of the software you are offering because they have more have economies of scale. You know, Google can offer a service to a lot of, lot of, lot of people and it doesn't matter if they offer it to a million or two million. But again, if Mercedes sells one or two million cars, have, you know, good for them, but still they have more building costs. And I don't think, anyway, I think for this reason, <coughs> Google or Apple will not invest in building their own cars. So they will rather buy them. They're, they're doing it actually right now. They, um, they also have signed a contract, I think it was Fiat Chrysler, where they also buy some trucks. And um, they will probably be rather than also like a service provider where they say, you know, we have our own autonomous driving system. We buy the cars from someone else, but then we let it drive, you know, under you know, our, our brand of, you know, like, like an Uber or Lyft or something or another autonomous driving service. Um, I think rather similar to the thing that Tesla is doing because we, we clearly see also with this example that Tesla is somehow positioned in the middle between the classic manufacturers and the software companies. They are somehow both, you know, they are, they are converging that. So um, this is a r big risk, but also big, big chance for them, you know. That's also the reason why they are introducing their own ride hauling service, eligible to buy a car at the dealers. So that's car buying in Germany. It's, it's, it's really frustrating sometimes. And then you have um, the, those, those you know, standard dealers sitting there and then like, uh, uh, come on, now I'll, I'll explain you the world and what you need and what you don't need. And actually when I want to buy a car, I want to spend some serious amount of money, I want to go to a dealer and say, oh, you know, I need this, this, this and that. And maybe let's like, you know, let me pick the color. This is my configuration I have already done at home. Please order that car, do everything for me. And next week I'll come around or next week, please drop the car off at my location. That's what I would expect from a modern, you know, because when I order an expensive TV or a smartphone or whatever, you know, you just go maybe reach to Amazon, click and buy and that's it. Maybe you've seen also like a review of that somewhere and then you already know about it. Um, but for example, last time I was buying a car, it was like such an annoying process again because you had to spend a lot of time, multiple uh, events at the dealers. Then you had annoying talks with the dealers and they didn't really understand what you want. And it's it's really annoying process. And I think that's also this, um, this is like a big topic in car sales and marketing at the moment, the so-called customer journey. And at the moment, the customer journey for cars in Germany this is horrible, it's absolutely horrible. And you wonder why this industry still makes so much money when they have such a horrible customer journey. So I think this is uh, like, like a big void that needs to be filled to make car sales easier in the future. Uh, they have to do it, otherwise, you know, people will just spend it somewhere else and as soon as someone can actually do that. I mean, Tesla somehow wants to make that with like also like online um, um, ordering and so, but then they have the problem that they don't have such good after sales service. So a lot of people are complaining when they have their cars that later on like the repairs is like cost intensive. They have to wait a couple of weeks for replacement parts because they don't have like this very big 
dealer infrastructure where they can get that you know in a, in a very fast rolling process so um yeah this, i mean you, you basically need both you need like the, the hard skills to get like the parts uh, in time delivery but you also need the soft skills to make it easy for the customer to buy a car and then those approaches with not actually doing the whole buying process but just saying like here's the 500 euros per month or whatever and i can use this car you know to whatever extent i wish this could be one thing with making it easier and just eliminating eliminating one of those organiz organizational um, uh, you know, no problems you might have when, when buying a car. I mean, is, is it easier to buy a car in the US? How, how do you do it? Yeah, used cars is, is easier, but then of course you can, um, you know, you, you might be unlucky and get a lemon car or something. So that, uh, that can also happen. So um, yeah, yeah, very interesting what's happening also sales-wise, <laughs> definitely. Um, and uh, now I want to talk about the last meta trend, and that's uh, sustainability. And you might wonder about this polluted water here, for example, and that's actually what people are also drinking and uh, washing themselves in and so on. And well, how is it connected to the car industry? This is one of the villages um, where leather is being produced. And the thing is, well, they need to dye it, use chemicals and so on. And you know, the, the modern indus industrial countries, this is here the, the, the dyes, the dye for the leather, where they tan everything. They don't have any work protection or, or whatsoever. Of course, there are also you know, other examples where it's maybe done with a little bit more work protection, but that's also um, uh, part of the truth. And of course, not to forget where everything is coming from, um, because when you, you know, just take a look at the car seat or so on, you wouldn't think about all the cruelty that is being involved there. Um, but who would seriously consider taking a knife, getting to the next cow, skin the cow, and then put the hide on the, on the seat. I guess no one in the room would seriously do that. But then when you see it finished in the car seat, you say, I oh, you know, it's dead anyway, so I just buy it. And they, they surely took, uh, took care of sustainability, but they didn't. So um, yeah, that's also what they do there. I think um, it's always hard to see some stuff like this, but I always say, um, you have to see at some point what they do to the animals to really understand what they're doing. So I, 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 I do you a favor and stop it, stop it here for, um, for you right there. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> yeah, I'll scroll a little bit further and um, yeah. That's by the way, this is a farm that is used, uh, that the automotive industry is using also. This is a JBS, it's one of the biggest um, leather manufacturers worldwide. So they don't care at all about that it's living beings. It's just products for them, you know, it's just products and, and that's it. How they're being kept there, how they feel pain, it does not matter at all. So, and that's, you know, yeah, I think we can, I can maybe spare you some more there. Um, there's a lot of more footage if someone is interested. And this, this is only just like the tip of the iceberg. And you see, it's only like one part of the car. And there are a lot of like, there are a lot of issues, of course, in general about the vehicle. If we talk about like the tires, for example, most of the uh, fine dust particles we, uh, we have, it's not from the exhaust, it's about the tires, you know, because uh, the rubber is being uh, um, rubbed onto the road and this also goes to the air, very, very fine rubber particles, it's a big problem. But at the moment, no one came yet up with a better solution than rubber tires. Probably there will be at some point, or maybe like a, like a magnetic field for cars, whatever, you know, that, could all be possible. But the thing is with leather, there are enough other alternatives already there. So uh, you have high grade of leatherettes, for example, you have fabric use, you have microfiber. So there is a solution and even, how, even just one that looks just like it, that feels like it. And it's, you know, you don't have to, you know, you, know, you don't have to miss anything, but it's just tradition and it's just in the heads. Most of the cars, by the way, they use a, a mix nowadays of um, animal leather and leatherette. So, for example, leatherette is on the outside and then you have the animal leather on the inside of the seats, for example. Um, it's, again, just tradition because I think, ah, you know, there where it has like contact to the body, it needs to be the real thing. And then the outside parts or at the dashboard where it's just for beauty, then we put the, the leatherette. Um, but again, it, it really depends on the high grade. There are some like 
taxi um, examples, for example, maybe everyone knows that well, like some cheap leatherette is being used and maybe breaks after a while. And therefore, sometimes leatherette has a bad image or so. But the thing is, the most expensive leatherette or leather overall there is, is used for yards, so for very expensive boats, because on the outside parts, they need something durable. It cannot be of, well, you know, of natural material because it would still rot. And then uh, people say, ah, you know, but leather is a natural material. But the thing is that it's really not in the final car because again, it's processed by chemicals, otherwise it would rot. Then they apply some paint to it. So every color you see in the car, is, it's just paint. And all when people say, oh, it has a certain smell, it's just perfume they add. So the smell you have there is the, is the perfume. And um, with the chemicals, there are some people have like those contact allergies. And I mean, when they, for example, touch a steering wheel or get on the seat, um, you know, they, they like, uh, get like bumps and red bruises on the, on the skin and so on. That's of course <laughs> only when you have contact allergy, but it shows actually because they are uh, sensitive to chemicals. That shows that it's actually there and, and everyone is actually uh, processing it. Um, we also did some calculations, by the way, if you just looked at the CO2 output together with Continental, one of the um, supplies we saw, um, uh, saw earlier than the automated driving part. And even if you just look at the CO2 output, just from the very final production, a leather red would, for example, be half in the CO2 output than for the real leather. Then, of course, you have to, when you also take into account that, you know, everything you did with the animals before and the land use, then, of course, the advantage is, is, is even further. Or if you think about electric vehicles and the practical use, when you get to, into a car in winter time, you have leather seats, it's cold, you need seat heating. If you get in summertime into it, the seat is hot, you need more cooling, especially for electric vehicles, future vehicles, this is also now a huge energy, energy aspect. So if you ask me which surface I should get, I would even not pick a leather red, I would go for just for a fabric seat because it has the best climate comfort. You know, it stays cool in summer, and it's also somewhat warm in winter times. So, um, but that's also a paradigm shift. Um, for example, uh, the, the, the Queen of England has always been driving on fabric. Just the driver had to, seat, uh, had, to be, had to be sitting on leather because of the durability of the sitting. But, you know, there in this respect, luxury was always combined, you know, with, with a fine fabric. And then after a while, the idea came up that luxury is combined with uh, animal height. You know, but there's also something that is shifting now and now. And for example, in Geneva, we've seen a lot of co new concept vehicles, which were actually completely um, free of any animal uh, source, even the steering wheel. And um, also we get like, you know, a lot of inquiries every day where we, we are being asked like, which car can I buy, which doesn't have any animal ingredient. And therefore, we also try to stop this PR uh, mechanism where like all the press texts were saying and then all the journalists were repeating those blah, 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 finest leather and mm -hmm, finest leather. And no, no one is actually questioning what, what's behind that. And we always include in our car reviews and we say like, you know, in the price list or in the, in the configurator, you can pick this, 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 and this. So we actually have like the, you know, the, the choice where you can actually go to and which material can you pick from. So this is like, you know, just one aspect of sustainability. There's of course even more about the drive trains and so on. But I think, um, especially when you have good alternatives, you know, we can try to make things which are like, you know, not that good for the environment, try to improve them a little bit without, uh, you know, risking anything or so, you know. Everyone knows it's better to walk or to drive a bicycle and we should do that as often as possible, you know, instead of taking the car. But I mean, it doesn't mean we have to stop our modern lives, you know, just to be able to improve something. And it's, it's really funny um, when you say stuff like this online, of course, you, you face um, the judgment of the world. And of, I mean, I get a lot of support for that too, because more and more people are interested in sustainability and also animal welfare. And I mean, it's also a lot of uh, human suffering involved there. There are also some special features. I can recommend them um, on the human suffering uh, in, in the leather industry. And, um, but you also get, of, of course, a lot of people who, you know, maybe feel offended and they say, oh, you know, I own a car with leather seat interior and then they feel bad about themselves and then they blame it on me that I gave the information. But I always say, you know, I also bought cars with leather seats inside before I knew better. Um, but it doesn't mean like, you know, it's just about, you know, your, your future choices, you know. And if, you, if you have the information, then you can also make um, different future choices. And 
how far this is shifting, by the way, um, you could also check out um, uh, uh, later or like those days on, on, on my channel. So uh, two weeks ago, I got an inquiry from an agency by the leather industry. And um, without you know any bargaining or something, they said, Ah, you know, you have like this, this car channel and, um, you know, they are slowly realizing that leather is, is declining in public opinion and more and more people are aware of that. And could you please say that leather is cool, sustainable, friendly to animals and is the best material for car seat interior? And by the way, we give you at least $15,000 if you say that. Without, you know, this was the first email. So before I was saying like, oh, could I maybe have double the amount or like what can we do in the future? And well, and the thing is, like most journalists or influencers would probably have just taken the money and went for it because, I mean, it's an easy thing to do. And I mean, I could very well use the 15,000 euros. I mean, I could have invited you to a great dinner this, this <laughs> evening, for example, that. Um, but actually, you know, because I'm not doing this uh, because of what, but because of the why, because I'm, you know, I'm doing this because, A, I'm a kind through this and I want to share information, I want to share true information. Um, I, mean, I didn't re even respond to them anymore. Instead, I made a video where I made this public, that they're trying to uh, trying to bribe other people and also to warn them actually that. And actually, some viewers responded and, see, and said, "Oh, good that you said that because just another car channel. I've seen another journalist who was going to see like, oh, this is the greatest smell of leather I've ever seen. This is so great. You should definitely buy those leather seats." Now people know where this is coming from. So they are having now like a big PR campaign effort to, um, what did they say, uh, in like, was it, like a PDF campaign briefing and they said they're uh, to, to, to make people love leather, leather again. So that's their goal. Um, yeah, but I think there's also some, something, you know, where um, at some point you have to th decide that, yeah, it's not all about money. It's all about creeping, keeping, uh, yeah, being honest to yourself. So this was a li little bit hard to digest. Therefore, we have some more fun as uh, our outro of the, um, <laughs> of the video lecture. That's what I like to en enjoy most. And yes, I'm burning a lot of fuel for that, just for you, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you, you see, I'm, I'm not a perfect person just because I'm, I, you know, I'm interested in animal welfare. I also like to hammer it, uh, floor it out at some point. This is also like a friend, is a driving instructor right there. Been doing a couple of driving events with him also. and. Yeah, driving on a, on an ice lake, this is up, up in Sweden, way in the polar circle, this is one of the most fun things you can actually do with the car. I even enjoy it more than driving on a dry race track, because um, yeah, this, this like this, the G forces are distributed in a you know more smooth way, and can you can really like uh, drift the car around like in a ballet or something. This is really a lot of fun. So, if you ever get the chance, there are also like some some customer programs from different from all different brands. They offer those driving academies. It's not really um, cheap uh, because, yeah, sometimes a car or two also break uh, at some point. Um, but I can really recommend it. It's it's quite safe also because usually like those snow pillows on the side are quite soft in contrast to when you take a lap on a Nordschleife or a Nürburgring or so. That can be very dangerous. I would not recommend to do that actually when you're not experienced driver. Um, but this one is something you can you know learn bit by bit, and it's really cool experience, also cool nature experience up there in the north. So. And you can, and also when when you see more of that, you can also take a um, you know a full review of that. So uh, basically, everything you s you've seen today, like the, all the small bits from the um, uh, from a video lecture, most of the time there are separate videos to each single topic to those, and you can find that on our channel, or you can f search for a different car or a different topic, and then just hit Auto Gefühl, so our channel name, together with the topic or with the car you're searching for, and you'll most probably find a video of that in the YouTube search. So, thanks for your attention. Cheers. So um, basically there are two things there. Um, first of all, like if you look at the, the premium side of it, like, like, like a very high grade animal skin, um, the animals are specifically raised for that because they don't like they shouldn't have like some stains from like some fences or something and they'll be kept on the and then there's of course like the mass market which is connected to the meat industry but the question is always like what difference does it make for the animal itself you know if you go here on the street and someone beats you down and kills you basically and then takes your smartphone and your purse would you actually care if the burglar was onto your smartphone or your purse. 
like what difference does it make for you, you know? So the meat industry could, where we say, you know, the leather is the outside skin of a cow, so they first take the skin, then the cow is already dead, so we just take the leftover meat, you know? Everyone was like, I guess it's a ridiculous argumentation, but it's the same other way around. So, you know, both could say it's a byproduct of the other one. But it's just, you know, like you give your money to an industry that earns money with killing animals. And that's, you know, the, the case in, 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 in both ones. You know, actually the, um, the hide is one of the most profitable parts overall. If you take like, if you split it into single parts, which is literally done. So the hide is like very profitable. So it's, you know, really makes sense to, to sell those. And if you go for alternative materials, they of course make less money and it's m less incentive to do it in that way and more incentive of course for other ways. For example, uh, one thing is very interesting, um, uh, Hugo Boss recently introduced also shoes with that uh, material. It's called uh, Pinatex. It's done with um, pineapple leaves. You know, so they take the fibers from pineapple leaves and make a leather out of it. That's also, for example, that's um, because the most leather red is um, uh, petroleum based or recycled plastics. So this is one example. Um, but to make it like even more full life cycle, you take a plant-based material, for example, those uh, pineapple leaves. So, and um, well, to me, you know, you can improve or, or make things worse in, in both ways. But the thing is, um, I said quite often there's no black and white because there's also like transition something in between or you say like, oh, they may be here, they help better and there are better working conditions or there are worse working conditions. But I think, you know, as long, you know, to a point when you come to life and death, there is just black and white, you know. I think there's no transition or middle way between life and death. There's no good or bad killing, you know. Death is always death and life is always life. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's exactly what, 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 what I was addressing. So um, it's about, you know, when, when you as a customer can decide which company should get my money, should it be a company who kills cows or should it be a company who takes pineapples from the ground? Okay. You know, that's what you can decide as a customer. You know, it's like I can just give the information, you know, like this is where it's coming from. And then you can decide as a customer, where do I want to spend my money? And, you know, the thing is, if, you know, the thing, how we were raised, like our base, base moral values, always appreciate life. And there's like, there's no culture on earth who doesn't like, or no religion or no belief system who does not appreciate life. It's just that, you know, in our everyday lives and in, in the big industry who tries to hide a lot of things from us because we would be irritated as a customers, you know, people just try to forget it, you know, and therefore you always have to remind yourself, like, how is something being produced? Where is it coming from? And do I really want to support that? Thanks again, man. <laughs>